Just a note for anybody who's in our waiting room right now wanting to speak uh, shortly, if you can hear me, um, we ask you to please name your Zoom link. Some of you have just iPhone or accordingly, but uh, if you could put a name to your Zoom link so we know what application you're here for. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Roberts, we're going to need you to turn on your camera so we can actually hopefully start this meeting and have some quorum. There he is. Thank you. Councillor Roberts, have you heard from Councillor Edwards to see whether or not he's going to be able to attend via phone? No, I, or not? No, I will call him right now. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you all. We uh, are missing a couple of councillors. I know Councillor Roberts is trying to get a hold of uh, Councillor Edwards. Uh, right now, we are missing Councillor Edwards. Councillor Mazan is relocating for a little better internet, I realize. And Councillor Jaglitz sends his regrets. Uh, we were notified of the passing of a uh, former board member of the MLA who I had the privilege of serving with and who was also a former CAO or an acting CAO for a brief time. Uh, and that is uh, John Kern. Uh, who passed away the funerals this afternoon and uh, Councillor Jagox is attending that funeral. So you unfortunately will not be with here with us today, but I would at this point, we do have quorum. I'd like to um, call this meeting to order at 1.18 p.m. And uh, as mentioned, we are uh, right now have regrets from Councillor Jagowitz. Uh, we're trying to get Councillor Edwards on the phone who was having some internet problems this morning and Councillor Mazan will be joining us. Uh, she's just relocating. Um, so those are the three away. I also today want to acknowledge that we're on lands traditionally occupied by Indigenous peoples. Indigenous peoples have cared for this territory for the benefit of future generations and their stewardship throughout the ages is certainly recognized. Uh, we did invite some public comment, obviously, for our meetings. And uh, we did receive correspondence from Planscape regarding OPA 56. Um, and that was Back to two of their clients. One of them is the Rosso Resort Development and the other is Legacy or Lakeside. Uh, additionally, uh, we have received correspondence directly from Muskoka Lakes Chamber of Commerce regarding Ballerina, as well as the Muskoka Lakes Association and Friends of Muskoka regarding OPA 56, which is the resort village of Manette. Uh, I also personally uh, would rec uh, comment that I received correspondence from Chief Philip Franks of the Wata First Nation regarding uh, the Bala Arena as well and their request to keep it open. <clears throat> so with that, uh, we did uh, issue a supplementary agenda and uh, that is to have an indicted, invited delegation uh, regarding Bala Arena, uh, but also a number of public comments. Uh, I'm not going to list all the people. We will let you speak accordingly when we get to that point. But um, so lots of supplemental agenda today. Uh, and I'll mention at the end of the meeting, but uh, I'll state it right now as well, that on Tuesday, November 23rd, we had a, a special uh, council meeting for a uh, special GNF committee meeting or for the public meeting for adoption of our operating capital budget. But uh, that meeting right now might be a strictly a committee meeting. So there'll be more information to come on that in the future. Moving along. Um, Double check where we're at. I think we're good so far. Uh, committee, with your indulgence, um, we've had a lot of uh, questions regarding our Bala Falls or Bala, Bala Falls. That's uh, 11 years of Freud um, regarding uh, Bala and our arena. And um, also, we also have our uh, Manette OPA. Both of those are contained in our consent agenda. With your uh, indulgence, I was going to pull those two items in particular so we can vote on them separately. Any issues with those two? None. So let me just move on, first of all, before we get to our delegations. And I'm going to try and enact the minutes from our various meetings prior. 
with the exception again, I'm going to leave out the Battle of Falls Arena, as well as our OPA number 56, I believe it is for Manette. So I have a resolution moved by Councillor Bridgman. Uh, seconded, I'm going to say by Councillor Roberts. Little change in that because Councillor Edwards isn't here. Be resolved that the mayor and council adopt and enact the following minutes and recommendations contained in the November 10th, 2021 consent agenda and direct staff to proceed with all necessary administrative actions. And that would be the October 7th, 2021 special council minutes, October 13th, 2021 general finance committee minutes, action items one to three and five to nine. Again, that's excluding item four, BALA uh, arena. Also the October 13th, 2021 council minutes, October 14th, planning committee meeting minutes and action items one to four and six to nine. October 25th, a special planning committee meeting minutes. Uh, and we are going to remove the resolution regarding the Minette OPA. Uh, November 3rd, 2021 special general finance committee meeting minutes and November 4th, special general finance committee meeting minutes and action item number two. Council, any questions on the adoption of those minutes and action items? All those in favor? Madam Clerk, I believe we're carried, thank you. That's wonderful. Uh, we do have a number of invited delegations, the first of which, let me check my notes, is regarding Bella Arena. And uh, we're going to let in Fred Orchard and Ross Davidson, I believe, are the two who are going to speak to that, and then we can deal with that agenda item. So, Madam Deputy, we'll see if we can get them in. Well, we have two on main, but we are assuming it's on them. Yeah. We're going to see who we can let in here. We have a couple of people who remain unnamed. Um, so just stare, stand by, everybody, for a brief moment. Okay, we're just, uh, we've got someone who's in the uh, waiting room known as user. And uh, there we go. Fred is welcome. I can see your camera on. Um, but we also let somebody in. Is user still there? I'm missing them. Anyway, Fred. Oh, that's you. You've got your name on. Welcome. We'll get you to turn on your microphone. There, am I on now? There we go, we can hear you. Maybe get you to speak up just a little bit uh, so that everybody can hear you. And uh, Fred, we've got yourself as well as Ross Davidson. Are you both, oh, you're replacing Ross. No, I'm replacing me. Ross today. Okay, not a problem at all. And uh, appreciate uh, the community involvement on this. I'm gonna turn the floor over to you. Um, technically you would have five minutes, but if you want to uh, shorten that up, I don't think anyone on council, as long as we got the message through, of your ask, which I think we're probably pretty clear of. We'll leave it over to you. Well, Go thank ahead. you. I uh, appreciate the time. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and councillors for the opportunity to speak today. Um, uh, my name is Fred Orchard, as, as most of you know. My family has been in the Bala area since 1870, which is 150 plus years now. And my great grandfather, John W. Orchard, was mayor of Bala for 19 terms a Canadian record for municipal service. My first memory of the ballerina is this. This is the nozzle that I used to help my grandfather, Sandy Orchard, hand scrape the ice and flood it on an old fire hose uh, when he was the manager of the old rink. And as a child, I spent more time in the old rink in the winter than anywhere else. Hockey was a huge part of my life, but I would skate every chance I could until the natural ice in the old rink succumbed to the warming of spring. By the early 70s, Ball and Port Carling, Port, excuse me, Port Carling needed new arenas. So in the spring of 73, the old arenas were demolished to make way for new modern buildings. The caveat was that each town would be responsible for raising half of the $220,000 cost of each arena. Each town received $10,000 from the federal government. And so, Ballin area citizens, led by Councillor and later Mayor George Prince, 
Bob Pierce, Chuck Jennings, Paul Davidson, and others held a walkathon to Gravenhurst, a pancake breakfast and carnival in the old rink before it was torn down, bottle drives, and many other events. The construction began and the new arena opened in less than a year. It was a joyous day when the new rink opened with artificial ice. No matter what the temperature outside was, the Ballarink rink always had the best ice in Muskoka, if not Ontario. I spent hours at the rink and raised my two daughters on the ice there as well. This arena has seen all Ontario championships in hockey, world-class figure skating competitions and exhibitions, competitive girls ringette, men's and ladies hockey leagues, and non-ice events such as lobster dinners, concerts, and boxing events, to name a few, all with the stands full of cheering fans. I took a break from hockey when I had a hip replacement four years ago, but I have 50 plus years of memories on the ice in Bala. From my driveway at home, I can see the homes where I count 13 young children now living with their parents. Young families are raising their children and need a place to meet and get their physical and mental health in shape after this global pandemic. If council votes to repurpose the ballerina and not put ice in it ever again, what memories will the children and parents have on my street and the streets of Bala, Torrance, Glen Orchard, Walker's Point, Mortimer's Point, and Wataw 50 years from now? Please don't let our kids down. I thank you very much for your time today, and I'll pass it back to you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you very much, Fred, and I uh, appreciate uh, the history. It's always interesting when we do learn about how some of these facilities came to be and truly the community involvement to get us there. Absolutely. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I believe we have uh, Diane Davidson, who's also going to speak on this. Diane, are you with us this morning? Your iPhone, I'm told. Third floor, Bala Arena. There we go. Diane, welcome to you. Okay, Diane, uh, you're on mute right now and we turned your camera off. So maybe we can reverse those two things. Still having technical, oh, there we go. We can hear you, Diane. So maybe just, I'll let you speak. Don't touch your phone because I think we can hear you at this point. Okay, I'm sorry. I am having problems with my laptop and camera. So I'm on my phone. Um, anyways, um, thank you, Mayor Harding and councillors for the opportunity to speak to you today about the importance of having the Bala Arena open. More importantly, that there is an ice surface in the arena for this upcoming 2021. 22 season. My friend Fred has just explained to you about the huge volunteer component that was crucial to the build of a new arena in town and their successes. Every family in town was exhausted after a year of various fundraising initiatives, but they reached their goal and together with the township, the new arena opened in 1974. The family and community memories that Fred spoke about that this arena has provided for the last 47 years are invaluable. And it's exciting to know that the same opportunity will be available for the many young families living in Bala and the surrounding area today. Heading into this winter season, most of our residents are looking forward to resuming some sort of normality in their lives. And in Bala, the arena is a central part of many lives here during the winter months. Good mental health and the benefits of a healthy lifestyle are regularly in the headlines around the world today. The Bala Arena is a perfect venue to offer families, both permanent and seasonal, the opportunity to have active lifestyle choices. Public skating, although it's not a huge revenue generator, is a great offering and an opportunity for young and old to be active and explore and learn a new winter sport. So it's one thing to have the arena open, but it's also like reopening a new business today. 
This new business should be marketed and advertised. And with all due respect to the workload of the township staff, whether this falls into economic development or parks and rec, it's important that the word get out, gets out that the Bala Arena is open for business. Advertising the days of operation, rental fee information, suggestions for various different ice rental options is all information that needs to be made public. Social media is a great venue. However, in our smaller communities, there are many households who don't have a computer or access to the internet. So there are other ways to communicate as well. Mail drops, um, mass mail drops of, of cardstock quality in surrounding post offices, for example, is a great, great way to reach many. And they then have something to hang on their fridge or on the dashboard of their car or whatever for, for, for future reference. Reconnecting with some of the hockey teams and regular users who frequented the arena in the past is another good resource. And I would volunteer to provide some of that contact information if desired. Ballot is open for the winter. We have several restaurants open daily, a bank, a pharmacy, other miscellaneous businesses, all who would benefit greatly from the economic opportunities provided with an open and vibrant arena. Last evening, I emailed each of you a proposal from four of our local businesses. This proposal is a fantastic representation, not only of the interest and enthusiasm of our area residents, but of a commitment to work together with the township to ensure that the Bala Arena is alive and thrives. And just this morning, I received word that another local business, Bala Court Storage, will again be making a donation of $1,000 worth of ice time between the Christmas and New Year's holidays. So on behalf of Bala and our surrounding communities, I hope Fred and I have clearly demonstrated the passion and the desire by all that the Bala Arena continue to offer a first-class ice service because that's the reputation our arena has for many more years to come. Thank you. Thank you very much, Diane. I appreciate that. Councilor Roberts, you have a question. Yeah. Um, yes, Chair. I have been contacted by uh, Councilor Edwards. He is in and he can see, but he can't hear anything. Can someone from staff call him and, and, and help him out? Um, I'll suggest to him to call in again. We, we will have someone from staff uh, call to uh, try and get him connected. Um, that's the best we can do at this particular point. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Councilor Howard, you had a question? Um, it's mostly when we do come to the vote, if we could have a recorded vote, please. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Much appreciated. Uh, Diane, thank you very much. Uh, Fred, also thank you for joining us today. And uh, thank you to the community for reaching out to uh, council over the last 30 days. Um, as we move forward in debating this, uh, we're gonna bring that agenda item forward. And I know that councillors Nishikawa, as well as Hayes have uh, requested to, to vote on this separately, which we've already agreed to do. But uh, I'm gonna turn to uh, Director Becking, first of all, because for us, uh, obviously to keep this open, there's going to be some cost implications and uh, based on changing our direction from a month ago, but uh, Director Becking, maybe if you wanna comment and then maybe uh, Director Donaldson can comment as well, just as to timing, if we were to uh, put the ice back in Bala, what would happen, thank you. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, uh, as Council's aware, currently the Bell Arena is closed. Um, uh, Council will recall that you passed a resolution to direct staff to, to uh, look at options for repurposing or creating other opportunities um, for use through the 2021-2022 uh, winter season. <clears throat> um, Currently, uh, expenditures to date are well below budget. The uh, 2021 budget for operation uh, is 333,100. Uh, actual expenditures, I don't have a current number, but they are well below. Um, at the last um, 
projection if council uh, chooses to proceed with with uh, opening or placing ice in the arena and opening it up to public use uh, you can probably expect um, year-end expenditures totaling somewhere between 275 and 285 thousand dollars for the year um, in terms of current utilization uh, we have a commitment for only one uh, use per week at the present time um, uh, totaling approximately an hour to two per week um, if it's open to uh, broad general use uh, it might amount to an additional few hours a week in terms of public skating and and related types of activities um in uh, in the case of the port carling arena we're currently running at about um, 60 percent of capacity um, uh, we are still waiting for some commitments from minor hockey with respect to their uh, winter game schedule uh, but i would expect that that will boost us to something between 80 and uh 85 percent of capacity so there is still uh a small amount of available capacity at the port carling arena um to accommodate uh other uses if if uh, council were so inclined okay um the one other thing i uh, sorry there was one other thing i wanted to mention your worship uh presently uh the 2022 draft um, operating budget uh, is based on the assumption that uh, the Bala Arena will stay closed for the winter of 2021-2022 and then reopen in, in uh, time for the 2022-2023 winter season. Um, if, uh, if you choose to put ice in, then um, uh, there will be an additional expense that goes along with the uh, with, uh, that decision uh, for the 2022 uh, operating budget, um, my my estimates would suggest that we're probably somewhere in the vicinity of hundred thousand dollars to to run it uh, uh, additionally. So uh, that's where we're at with that one. Uh, with that, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to try and answer them. Okay, thank you for that, Director Becking. I'm actually going to pause the questions for a moment. I'm just going to let uh, Director Donaldson comment just so we get the full picture. Um, and again, if we are to open it, you've alluded to maybe it's 100,000, maybe not, but Director Donaldson, maybe you can chime in so that we can debate going forward or ask questions. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. And I just wanted to uh, reiterate the last point that Director Becking made with respect to the 2022 uh, budget that was presented last week and uh, committee sent uh, staff back to uh, rework some of those numbers. It, it if the inclusion of additional costs related to BALA uh, are considered, then that resets our, our increase. We weren't, we would no longer be at the 5% that we presented at those meetings last week. Uh, we would actually be closer to six, probably in the neighborhood of 5.7 or 5.8% uh, because those costs were omitted from that presentation. So I just wanted to make sure members of council were aware uh, of, that, of that change. Okay, thank you for that. I'll turn it to Council at this particular point. Councilor Nishikawa first. Thank you. Um, most importantly, we've we've heard from the public. We didn't really have much comment. Uh, I know I personally received two messages prior to it going to general finance, um, and I'm I'm glad that we we've, we've heard the com from the public. Whether we like it or not. It's a long way to go from Walker's Point, Torrance, Bala for children to, to use the facilities in Port Carling. It's, it's a, and, and on top of that, the fact that Port Carling is virtually not open makes it very difficult in the wintertime um, for, for other ability, like, you know, for a family to go shopping and go skating for instance, like all of those other things that where, why people go to different facilities. But I believe that we have heard from the public and that um, very strong and clearly, and they've also suggested that there are 
uh, getting others to step up to use the facilities. However, that works with COVID because I, I don't know um, what would, uh, my understanding is that they would also have to have a volunteer component uh, with each group to take on the, uh, the responsibility of um, the vaccine checks and, and all of the other things that go with that. But I believe that we just need to move forward because that is what the members of our community have said that they wanted. Okay. Thank you for that. Councillor Zavitz and then Councillor Hayes and hopefully just adding to Councillor Nishikawa's comments or specific questions. Thank you. Uh, good, thank you and through you, Mayor. I, I have um, a statement and the, a question and then a subsequent question if uh, you'd be so kind to allow me. First of all, I want to acknowledge uh, the public presence today and certainly uh, I, I'm well aware of some 1,465 names on uh, an electronic petition and then a uh, an actual a paper uh, that was gone, we canvassed door to door in Bala. So to Councillor Anishkawa's point, there are some 1500 people certainly that put their name to this. But I think more importantly than that, I, 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 and I have a, I guess I have a question of, of, of staff and I guess if I could probably to Mark, um, uh, Mr. Donaldson, our, our Director of uh, Financial Services, how did the Bala Arena ice in become a, a financial issue when for 47 years it's been a an assumed piece it's it's all of a sudden um and I, if i might go on with that reasoning uh covid hit in 2019 up to that time 2018 i'm believing that uh, we had minimal use in that arena and it wasn't it wasn't pulling its own weight. 2019 sounds like it was about the same sort of a result for that building somehow in 2020 and now into 2021 and now a cautionary tale into 2022, we're being warned that that's gonna cost, what it's gonna to cost to run this arena. I haven't heard a word about what it's gonna to cost to run uh, Port Carling because we've always had two arenas. And somewhere, somewhere this discussion got, got way off the rails. So, uh, you know, I, I need to understand that. And if I could, Director Donaldson, could you shine some light on how this became a financial issue with this committee. Director Donaldson. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you. So I will uh, I will ask uh, Director Becking to help me with this one, but I will tell you that the information that was used to prepare the 2022 draft budget that was presented last week, which I think is uh, where we're starting from, was based on the best information available. And at that time, it was the understanding of staff that the Vela Arena would not have ice in it for the current season. Uh, and therefore, that was the assumption that was used in terms of its preparation. So the addition of the ice and the incremental costs associated with that would then be a new item not included in that draft last week. And Mr. Becking may have additional uh, facts or information he may wish to add. Uh, Director and uh, Director Becking, I'm, I'm actually going to hold for a second. Um, and I know our CIO wants to chime in. Uh, I think where we're at today in this discussion, number one, is do we want to put the ice back in or not? That's the topic and the question in front of us. Uh, we do have some larger issues on Port Carling or Bala, and I'm not sure it's 100% fair uh, for our staff to answer that. I do know that about five or six years ago, for those people who were sitting around this table, there was a report that actually came to Councillor Committee at the time that recommended closure of the uh, Bala Arena, and that was uh, turned down by Council at the time. So I just, I really want to remain focused if we can today, Councillor Zavis, on the question of ice in or ice out. Uh, we do know that we have heard from uh, both Director Becking and Director Donaldson uh, that that uh, is going to be about $100,000. And uh, we can look at that specific decision today because that is the topic on the table. Councillor Zavitz, you had a supplemental question? Thank you. I appreciate, appreciate your comments and I will uh, respect your position. I just must say though that... Um, because this goes back to uh, September, then we viewed that as let's go into October with a, a more fulsome staff report, which finds us where we are today. Um, we were told in the staff report that the user groups were were uh, were were discussed, were 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 pulled, if you will, and there was minimal, you know, minimal interest. And yet here we have one thousand four hundred and sixty six people coming forward and saying, you know, we we want ice. And 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 certainly, if we're going to change the level of service, which 
which I'm hearing, you know, yin and yang on, uh, that can't be something I would support. I would, I would never be an, an advocate of, of taking something away from a community that's had it for 45 years. Uh, ever. Uh, that was never my mandate. If I had known that, I would never would have supported any of this in terms of repurposing anything, because quite frankly, the people have spoken. Thank you. Okay, I appreciate that comment. Let's go to Councillor Hayes. Thank you. And uh, through you, it's more of a comment than a question. Um, our two youngest learned how to skate at the Bala Arena during public skating. And a few years ago, I was privileged to present the, um, the winning medals to the ringette teams for the Ontario Winter Games. And Bala was packed. It was, it was hard to find a parking spot that day. Um, and without the arena being open, these opportunities for both single families and for larger events uh, would be missed out. And for the limited amount of recreation that there are for um, families in the winter time. Um, I, I think that it would be a shame to to lose this. We did hear that the uh, public was um, not pursuing the arena to be open and the facilities were considered for other things. We have now heard from the public that no, 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 that's not what they are. And now that they know that we're considering it, they've come forward and they've said, we are committing to be there. So I think that we have to at least, at very least, keep it open for this season and see how things go. Once there's that renewed invigoration in the arena, I'm sure that we will um, exceed the expectations that we are looking for. And not all the things that we do for the community have to be money-making, and a lot of them don't even break even. But we do provide things for the community to do, and I think that's our job. So I would support this going forward. Thank you very much, Councillor Bridgman. Thank you, um, Mayor Harding. Just, just a quick comment because, and I, I think this is important for people listening in. When we had that document a month and a half ago, we were at a different spot with COVID. And I clearly remember, and it made sense at that time to leave the Bala Arena closed, but I clearly remember the question being asked, if things change, how long will it take you, Director Beck Decking, to put the ice in? And that was four or five days. So I have to tell you that I left that meeting with the understanding that this was not a done deal for the winter, but at the that was the best decision at the point of time. COVID has changed, and so that's why we're back here now. So I just, I just really want everybody to understand that it wasn't a closed door, in my opinion, uh, at that meeting in September. So that's my comment. Thank you for that, Councillor Roberts. And then I'm gonna call the question. Uh, thank you, and through you, Chair. Um, this is a difficult one. Um, I, I, uh, Councillor Zavitz did try to ask this question and I need some clarification on this. And because in September, it was like if COVID changed, then um, we would re, uh, you know, the policies loosened, we would re, we would consider opening Bella. What, it's really the cost. The cost is how in the heck do we, could, our budget is overstated then, or, or, or not overstated, it's like $275,000 missing from the budget where it should have been in it as an, as an earmark saying could be opened if, um, um, if if council deem, deems necessary, because uh, this is a heck of a, a jump in our in our levy. Um, so, anyways, that's what's my concern is that I agree with Councillor Bridgman. The whole thing was not was not shut me down because of costs. It was shut down because of COVID restrictions. Uh, thank you for that. To sort of summarize, and uh, Director Donaldson, you can confirm or not, basically, you know, a month and a half ago, when the report was written, we were under certain COVID protocols. It didn't make sense to open BALA. There was a recommendation put forward. The budgets reflected the non-opening of BALA. Today, we're being forced with a change in COVID, a certain large outcry from the community to open the arena, and it's going to have about a $100,000 impact on our bottom line uh, that we will have to contemplate going forward. Uh, but at the end of the day, I believe it's council's decision to say yes, and we will have to find ways to pay for that if we want to do it. It's that simple. Director Donaldson, did you want to comment anymore? 
Uh, nothing to add, Your Worship. I think you've captured it uh, good. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Councilor Kelly. Uh, thank you, and through you, uh, through you I, I'm, uh, I'm not going to dwell on how we got here. Uh, certainly, we've heard uh, pretty compelling stories from a lot of people over the last week or two, and two in particular today who, who delegated. Uh, and I think everybody here is pretty clear where I stand on spending more money. But there's nothing that I would rather spend more money on than the mental health and physical health, too, of our constituents, particularly uh, young, young kids. And so uh, having heard Mr. Orchard speak to that. We can't let the money stand in the way. And um, I'm ready to, to change my vote. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Councilor Mazan, and then I'm going to call the question. Uh, thank you, and through you, uh, I don't want to repeat a lot of the comments that have already been made. Uh, I think this council in the last couple of years, since the beginning of COVID, and in the very early days, has made a commitment to recreation in a lot of different fronts. When COVID hit, we tried to pivot, and we um, tried to look for other activities that were outside. Um, and all with the goal of trying to add service to our community, to give them a safe place to be outside, to be active, to be together and for their mental health. So as a, a huge advocate of uh, recreation, um, I do want to ask our uh, director of public works, uh, Mr. Becking, is it possible through our recreation master plan uh, for us to perhaps add another public element to ensure that the members of the community have, have their voices heard. And by that, I mean, one of the things that I've been very struck by over the last couple of weeks with the calls and the different uh, messages is there may not have been the full understanding that this township has actually been for the last six months embarking on this exact path, is trying to understand recreation in the township of the Muskoka Lakes and create a capital plan for the next 10 years that will, will, will meet the needs in a sustainable way. So um, I guess with that, I, I, for those who are listening, we've just completed our public survey, but I, I would hate to think that, um, you know, we've spent so much time trying to ensure the engagement. Uh, is that a possibility? Thank you. I'm gonna to go to Director Beckham, but I just wanna make one comment because I think the common theme, uh, it, it extends beyond recreational master plans and facilities. It will extend to every decision this council makes. And again, we have a committee one month, we ratify things 30 days later, um, but I'll use the word communication and increased communication. Uh, file that in the back of your brain in about a month's time when we get back to budget time. Director Becking, did you wanna comment specifically on uh, recreational master plan? Certainly, the recreational master plan, uh, as council is aware, is intended to, to provide a direction and a vision for the next 10 years as it relates to this uh, book of services that, that we provide to the community. Um, from what I'm gathering from the various comments that I've heard over the course of the last couple of weeks, it would appear that there may have been some kind of a disconnect, particularly as it relates to the Bala community. Uh, certainly we can, um, the, the, the survey has now closed and, and it, it represents a body of work that, that has to stand on its own two feet. That having been said, um, we can uh, conduct some kind of a public meeting or a public, uh, uh, provide an opportunity for the public from BALA specifically uh, to uh, voice their, their concerns and issues and, and wishes and desires. And uh, we can then subsequently bring that into the, into the, uh, the mix as we move forward with, uh, with setting the, uh, the direction for the plan. Thank you. Thank you for that. Okay, I have a resolution moved by Councillor Nishikawa, seconded by Councillor Hayes, whereas Ward A residents have expressed their desire for the installation of ice in the Bala Arena as opposed to its use as a walking track and other such alternative uses during the 2021-2022 winter season. 
be it resolved that staff be directed to install ice in the Val Arena for community use during the 2021-2022 winter season as soon as possible. Councillor Zavitz, you have a question. This is asked for as a recorded vote though. Councillor Zavitz, question first. Uh, thank you, it's for you. Um, do we not have to rescind the motion that's in front of us, which was to repurpose the Bala Arena? Are we just gonna, I, you obviously you have, a, you have a reasoning for doing this right now, but we're gonna, we're gonna put ice in the arena when the real motion in front of us is whether we as a council are gonna move ahead with the repurposing of the Bella Arena. Do we not have to vote uh, that down, if you will, and then read this motion? Uh, we actually haven't read that motion, if I may, but I'll turn to the clerk for specific action on that and how we proceed forward. Thank you. Well, there was an action. There was an action item that was uh, pulled and this is a new motion that would uh, relate to actually putting ice in the Bell Arena. So instead of the action item that res would result in uh, use of alternative uses for the Bell Arena, this is actually a specific, that was pulled, and this is a specific motion regarding putting ice uh, that was a, a, given with a proper notice motion. Thank you for that. I have uh, read the resolution. I'll turn now to the clerk for a recorded vote. Okay, so Councillor Bridgman. Yay. Oh, we didn't hear you. What? Yes. Not hear me. Councillor Edwards. Yes. Councillor Hayes. Yes. Councillor Jagelwitz, I don't, I don't believe he's here. Councillor Kelly. Yes. <clears throat> Councillor Mazan. Yes. Councillor Nish Nishikawa. Yes. Councillor Roberts. Yes. Councillor Zavitz. Yes. And Mayor Harding. Yes. So that is carried. Okay, thank you. We'll turn off your speaker. <laughs> Councillor or Mayor Harding, did you get my correct vote? Yes? Yes, we did. I was unclear that. on that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. The uh, speaker is usually uh, on through the uh, whoever's speaking in the thing, and we just had a little on and off. I, I just want to say to the community of Bala and to council, uh, the reality is things change. And what I appreciate about this council is we're not always right. And sometimes recommendations need to be amended and changed. And that's uh, clearly the case in this particular instance. So uh, thank you uh, for those who participated, for those who came out to Bala, for the emails, phone calls. Um, look forward to uh, a skate in Bala this winter. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna move on. Um, we do have, and Director Pink, I'm gonna maybe go to you because we have, a whole bunch of delegations regarding our um, Manette OPA, but we also have, and I might be able to just knock this one off faster a little bit. We have Mr. Fawner here regarding the Mursky application, and I'm not sure whether or not it's appropriate that we kind of move that ahead, because um, I think we will be here, or Mr. Fawner, if you don't mind hanging in there. Um, is Mr. Fawner in the uh, waiting room? I, he is in the waiting room. But let's uh, let Mr. Fawner in just to see if there he is. Good afternoon, Mr. Fawner. Welcome. I, I'm sure, Steve, that you're going to be uh, hanging in intently to see what does happen with uh, Manette, uh, just out of curiosity. Um, but I'm not sure whether or not uh, are you okay to wait till we get to your item? But we're probably going to be, I'm going to guess, a good 45 minutes to an hour before we get there. Um, or just in the experience of time, we could potentially advance yours. Do you have a preference necessarily, Steve? Go ahead. I'm looking for the unmute button, there it is. Yeah, sorry, Mary Harding, I, I must admit, I do have my ears on, but only to look at. I wasn't listening, <laughs> quite frankly. Um, okay. I'm, I'm okay with whatever you wish to do. I will only be literally uh, the two minutes and that will be it. Okay, maybe uh, Steve, we'll get you just to comment at this particular point. You were on the agenda for 1.30. 
Um, and uh, council, maybe we can file in the background. We may not deal with the application right now, but we could call you back if we need to. So any comments on the Mersky application? You were here to delegate at that time. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, uh, Mayor Harding and uh, members of uh, Council. I just wanted to quickly say that uh, uh, thank you very much for staff in this particular application. This is the one that involves uh, Jackson Island and, La and Laura Leah Island. Um, appreciate the comments and their thorough review. Um, just want to note uh, Pinestone Engineering has been retained for the stormwater management report and we have uh, Arbor Cart Culture who is uh, doing the uh, tree inventory and tree preservation plan, and those are underway. I guess lastly, I was just uh, wanting to say that uh, given that staff has already been to the site and certainly council has seen it, you know, we anticipate having a site plan application in by the end of November, and we're certainly hoping uh, that'll be right around the uh, end of the appeal period, assuming we have approval of the bylaw today. Uh, and we're hoping that staff will be able to, uh, you know, they won't have to do a site visit, so we're hoping that uh, they can be, uh, you know, fairly quickly on to review of the uh, site plan application. And those are all my comments. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, seeing that, I don't see any need to advance the uh, bylaw at this particular point, uh, unless planning staff uh, are contrary. We can file those uh, comments. Uh, thank you, and uh, appreciate uh, you. representing your client here today. I'll turn your camera off. I'll put you back in the waiting room so you can listen to the much anticipated and much awaited OPA uh, for Manette. Um, Mr. Pink, did you or Mr. Sharp, who wants to introduce this first of all, and then we can go to some of our delegations today. Just a quick overview. Thank you, Worship. If, uh, if we are moving on to the uh, uh, Minette uh, official plan amendment OPA 56. Um, I don't think it needs uh, too much of an introduction and has been uh, in front of a uh, committee on a number of occasions and we're pleased to uh, provide you with the latest draft of OPA 56. There's a brief uh, covering report that does outline uh, at a high level those changes that were made based on the directions received at the last meeting. There was also a request to confirm the height of the uh, Cleveland's House Lodge main building, as well as provide those planning approvals that was previously given uh, for those uh, docks that were constructed. Um, and I've attached that to, to the agenda uh, for your information. Uh, lastly, I just would also note uh, two, uh, two matters. Uh, one, please keep in mind uh, with respect to the, the process involved. Uh, what's before you is consideration of adoption of the official plan amendment. Uh, the record would then be forwarded to the district and the district uh, would be responsible for final approval. And there is an opportunity for future modifications or changes uh, and future discussions uh, through that process. As I do note, uh, there are a number of speakers today. Uh, there is one uh, clarification that I think uh, may be helpful to be made that was just uh, uh, made aware to me just earlier today. Uh, one of the general refinements for consistency uh, as directed by committee was to um, uh, clarify the maximum unit size uh, for the JW Marriott and Legacy Cottages property to align with the remaining uh, resort lands in the resort village of Manette. Um, unfortunately, the, the wording of the policy just references a maximum unit size as opposed to a maximum equivalent uh, unit size. Uh, so that is a small clarification that uh, likely would be uh, beneficial uh, to make. Um, I'm certainly uh, interested to hear uh, from those delegations and available to answer any questions from uh, council as we move through this uh, Resolution. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that uh, quick overview. And uh, council, we do. It is down the agenda. We have a number of reports ahead of time, but because we have so many people who are attending at 1:30 to speak on this topic, I think it's appropriate that we uh, move Manette OPA up on the agenda. So, Madam Deputy, maybe we can start to bring some people in. I think our uh, first delegation. Check my reading notes here. Um, I think that's all on our supplemental agenda, is it not? Public comments. And uh, oh, look at this. My good friend, Mr. Pato. Let's welcome Frank, too. And for those people who are speaking here on public comments, we've gone through a number of public meetings on this. Uh, hopefully, you can hear me. Um, but uh, we're going to request that you keep your comments to two minutes. And uh, if, uh, if somebody else has made the same comment, I'm really going to be asking that you do not repeat the same comments that somebody else has made on this. 
um, and that maybe your two minutes becomes a minute and a half or a minute. And uh, if you want to say ditto to the prior speaker, that would also be appropriate. Um, thank you so much. Mr. Pato, welcome. Nice new boat in the background. It's a place we like to keep him, but we'll try and uh, get Mr. Pato off of mute so we can hear him. Uh, greetings, Your Worship and members of council. Can you hear me okay? Uh, thanks for the chance to delegate. I, I really have, um, first of all, thank you for all your work on this Minette OPA. Uh, my comments are in the form of a question, which is uh, following up to the report by David Pink. I'm uh, focused again on the issue of docking. As you know, I served on the Minette Joint Policy Review uh, steering committee, we commissioned a boat traffic study that reported that uh, Wallace Bay already exceeded the safe boating capacity of the lake um, on multiple times. In fact, every single day they measured. Um, and my question is, are we proposing now in this new OPA that's going to be approved today to double the size of the docking in the net? And it's really just a question uh, to the schedules that David's added, uh, sorry, the director Pink has added to his report. I hope we're not proposing to approve these schedules as part of the OPA amendment that's going on today, because I don't know what to call it, but uh, this page here, which shows the, well, I don't know if you can see it or not, the new docking for 150 new boat slips uh, at the Cleveland's house, you know, SWS Marina. Uh, first of all, I don't think that's approved today. I believe there's an environmental hold on that old plan that was put in place. I think the boat traffic consultant we hired reported that they used faulty analysis to get that approved back 12 years ago. They used an area of 1.5 hectares per boat when all the traffic studies said it should be at least five to seven hectares per boat. And we know it's over capacity now. So we referred to this number of 215, which came from Director Pink. I strongly recommend you add the wording that you would approve all legally existing and you know fully approved, not conditionally with a hold approved, docking slips, but any increase over, and I would re reference this hard number of 215 slips, uh, would be subject to further boat traffic studies uh, to the township's satisfaction. I think it would be a terrible mistake, and maybe I just don't understand, and I, I, I certainly am the first to admit that I get confused all the time, but I'm hopefully we're not going to be including these schedules for approval. Uh, you can't really see what I'm holding up, I guess, but, but the, the schedules to Director's Pink report as part of the official OPA that's being voted on in this meeting. Um, uh, and with those comments, I just wanna thank you again for all your hard work on this and um, your patience in letting me delegate multiple times. So thank you very much. And uh, lastly, uh, although I'm in the United States, I'd like to wish everybody a somber and reflective uh, Remembrance Day uh, tomorrow. Thank you for that, uh, Mr. Pato. Mr. Pink, do you wanna comment on the language? within the OPA and how many slips, what's approved and what we would be granting in this. Thank you. Thank you, uh, through you. Uh, no, the, uh, those uh, uh, prior approvals or drawings on your agenda are not uh, before you for approval today. Those are previously approved, either site plan agreements or zoning bylaw amendments. Uh, so they are um, currently in effect and speak to uh, the questions that committee had to get clarification on the number of boat slips in the resort village. And I think you can see by reviewing those drawings, you can see the difficulty in hanging your hat on a precise uh, number. Um, and uh, the what I would uh, note is uh, I don't believe it was ever committee's direction uh, to uh, remove uh, the rights of those previous approvals. And my read of the current draft policies I uh, would stipulate that uh, those existing docks uh, that are currently approved, any additional beyond those would require further boat impact analysis and uh, and study. Just lastly, would also clarify, I don't believe it was myself uh, that uh, came up with the 215 figure. I believe that was through discussions with the uh, working group um, that number was uh, uh, derived at. Uh, but again, I think the accuracy of it um, is questionable when you re review those four prior approvals on the four prominent properties in the resort village. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Frank, we're going to just digest that comment. Appreciate uh, you on a supplemental. The bottom line is we're not granting any additional approvals. Uh, only prior approved docs would be there. Enjoy. So your worship, just 
quickly as a supplemental, and I, first of all, I want to withdraw my comment about the number coming from Director Pink. That was my recollection, but I certainly stand corrected by him. I know we discussed that number 215 in the committee. But my broader comment is this schedule, and I'm sorry you can't see what I'm holding up in his report, it doesn't seem to have the reference to the environmental hold on this potential addition of 150 new boat slips at the uh, SWS uh, marina, you know, the, the dock going out 500 feet into the bay with finger slips on it. I don't believe those finger slips exist today. And my understanding was that the addition of those finger slips was conditional upon, for example, getting the speed limit in the entire bay lowered to nine kilometers an hour. So I just wonder why we picked this page, which didn't have the environmental hold on it, when my understanding is what exists today is an environmental hold. Okay. That's really Thank the you. question. We've got that. Uh, David, did you want to comment quickly? And then we're going to move on to the next speaker. Uh, the uh, Mr. Pato is correct. Uh, the outer slips are subject to a hold. Uh, that's currently uh, in place. I can certainly, I believe, I just attached this drawing as it was more clear to see the number of slips. Uh, but what's before you today would not impact uh, or change uh, the zoning bylaw uh, and the, the uh, hold or approval that's in place for those additional slips. I believe this was discussed at a previous council or committee meeting uh, quite some time ago. The only way to uh, repeal that 2008 bylaw is to go through a zoning bylaw amendment process, uh, which would have to at this point presumably be initiated by the municipality um, and uh, consist of a public meeting and passage of a bylaw and appeal rights. So uh, that would have to be the process in order to remove uh, those approvals. I don't believe there's been any uh, direction from committee or council to, uh, to do that. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that and uh, appreciate it. Bottom line, we aren't granting any extras and whatever hold provisions would be in place today would remain in place, if I'm not mistaken. Let's welcome Mr. Richards uh, to the Zoom room and then we'll put Mr. Pierce on deck, so to speak. Paul, good afternoon and welcome. If you're just connecting to audio. I'm not sure if Paul's on, uh, nope, delay, there we go. He can hear us. Mr. Richards, can you hear us? Can you, I, I think you're connecting. I'm not sure if you're on mute or not. Having a hard time connecting Paul to audio. How's your sign language, Paul? Paul, if you're hearing this, I think you might be listening on the delayed broadcast. Um, we can't hear you at this particular time. Still says connecting to audio. Paul, I'm gonna recommend if you can hear me that you, uh, you log back out of the meeting. We're gonna go on and we'll bring you back at a point in the future so we don't have to uh, figure out your audio. There's something going on with your audio and uh, I guess your IT department's coming in to help. Maybe send them over here to our IT department. Still not connecting. Okay, uh, do we have Mr. Pierce in the waiting room? Okay, we're gonna let Ken Pierce in. Paul, we're gonna put you back into the waiting room. Maybe disconnect and then reconnect or we can just disconnect, Paul, there we go. And we're going to welcome Ken Pierce. Welcome, Ken. He's just uh, connecting to audio. Maybe everybody's going to have a hard time connecting to audio today. Ken, can you hear us? Oh, there we go. You're connected. Wonderful. We'll get you to unmute your microphone. There we go. Welcome, Ken. We're going to give you two minutes. And your time starts now. Okay, uh, thank you, Mayor Harding and Councillors. Uh, Ken Pierce, 2232 Muskoka Road, 169. I just wanted to make two clarifications uh, on the most recent draft, uh, commercial use of resorts. Uh, as you will recall from the legacy LPAT decision, uh, there was little scope left for the township to finalize the condominium agreement uh, due to the wording of the uh, decision that was made. Uh, the Minette OPA is a policy document. It's fairly high level. Uh, and while we commend uh, Council for including the resort rules in Section C1.9, uh, and they are somewhat detailed, I don't think it was the intent that uh, the list was going to be exhaustive. Uh, and so, um, uh, unfortunately, the 
uh, commercial use sections as currently drafted could be interpreted that way in, in my view. And I think there's a simple solution uh, where it says, please consider, uh, sorry, uh, please consider changing identified in section C1.9. If you just said uh, generally identified in section C1.9. Uh, secondly, at the end of the, uh, the, the provision, it says, uh, and changing in accordance with the uh, provisions uh, of section C1.9 to including uh, the provisions of C 1.9. I think that would solve the problem. I, had, uh, I hate to raise it. It's fairly technical, but I think it's very important. And if the intent was not to be uh, exhaustive, then I think that would be a, an appropriate change to make. Uh, my second comment is who is a unit owner? Uh, I, I applaud council for having in there that uh, uh, the rental pool requirements are going to, and the other requirements are going to be captured uh, by not only individual owners, but also corporations and partnerships. Uh, and the initial draft said, uh, and uh, unit owners and members of their immediate family. Uh, the next draft that came out uh, took that language out and said, unit owners and their guests. Uh, I'm not sure if there was discussion by council on that particular one, uh, but I would uh, strongly uh, recommend that it be uh, changed back to include unit owners and their immediate family uh, and their guests, if, if you want to do it that way. I think that would be a, a, a much superior way to make sure that the provisions are caught. As an example, if I owned a okay. unit- And I'm going to get you, we're just over two minutes, so- uh, I, I'm just so wrapping up. So it would be, if, it, if I owned a unit, it, it would be my father or my daughter or something like that. I, I think we need to include those in who the exclusive use applies to. Thank you. Understood, thank you. Uh, Mr. Pink, did you wanna comment on that particularly? Um, and I'll go to the exclusive use of friends and family or guests, uh, or guests include friends and family or not. Maybe David. You know, I guess my, uh, I don't really have any, any comments other than I'm typically remiss to sort of draft policy on the fly uh, and prefer to take some time to uh, think things through and also in fairness to, to others who have been involved in this process to uh, sort of make changes at this uh, late stage can sometimes uh, run into issues, but uh, certainly uh, my initial review, I don't see any uh, you know, uh, considerable red flags raised with those two uh, suggestions. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Pierce, thank you for the delegation. I think the other thing that uh, should be noted that as we move this on today, potentially, uh, it would be going to the district and minor little tweaks of this type and nature and language might be coming back from the district to us. Um, and or we could also make some potential further modifications accordingly as Mr. Pink would feel suited accordingly. So thank you for that. And Ken, thank you. Um, thank have we got Mr. Richards back in the waiting room? We have him back in. Let's see if we can uh, connect him to audio. There we go. There's Paul one more time. You can see us. Paul, can you hear us? Feel free to wave. We're still connecting to audio. Paul's moving over. We cannot hear you, Paul. And my gut feeling is that you are, again, listening to the YouTube broadcast, which is about a 20 second delay. Oh, there we go. We've connected to audio. Paul, you're there. We'll get you to unmute. There can we go. You hear me now we can hear you now. It just opened. The it's system it. was, I had, I had Jordy with me and he's a pro. Wonderful. Okay. You've got two minutes, Paul. Oh, okay. This Chairman Phil Harding, uh, thank you and councillors. Uh, one con confusion, the Mr. Pink referred to several more meetings regarding the OP for Manette. Are there one OP or two, two OPs? Is there one for the township and one for Manette? I assumed it was all for one. I communicated with three different people this morning. None of them knew this was the final meeting for Manette. Two of them were badly informed. There's got to be a better communication system. There's a very good communication system available in Manette and it should be used. 
for meetings like this. The people in the net need to have communication for what's going on. I also want to talk about the <clears throat> staff housing. I'm delighted with the amendment that's being proposed and uh, that's going to make everybody in the community much happier. On the on-site management, in-person management shall be available on-site at all times of guest occupancy in order to respond to complaints, deal with emergencies, and assist guests and visitors. Good, but the next line is not needed. Cleveland's House and the Merit are very sophisticated in what is required for staff management. The legacy has already signed an agreement, so it's done. There are no more resorts. The next line, next line can lead to confusion and trouble. The appropriate management arrangement will depend on the scale, location, on-site resort, related amenities, and desired experience of resort. What does this mean? It's like a should or a best efforts. We've got to get rid of that line or it's going to create problems with legacy in the future. They've already agreed. Why stir up trouble? Thank you very much. I'm done. <laughs> How's my timing? Well, you're absolutely perfect. <laughs> you're you're well-versed in Manette OPA, let me say. You came in just under the two-minute wire. Um, I'll and turn I'm sorry to, about the uh, trouble, but the screen was not letting me in. I had George working on it. <laughs> no problem. The, um, I'll, I'll turn to Director Pink, but uh, my, my belief on the language that is in the uh, on-site management, I, and I, I appreciate that Legacy is already a done deal, but you talk about Cleveland's House and the Marriott. Um, this is an official plan amendment to zone the entire lands, so it would also be for future tenants should legacy leave or somebody happen and there's a change. So it would not remove the existing policies, I believe, under legacy, but Mr. Pink, maybe you can comment quickly as to why the language is as it is. David? I apologize. Perhaps if the speaker could clarify, I, I'm a little unclear as to the confusion as to multiple amendments. The uh, this official plan policies would apply to the entire resort village and replace those policies that are currently in the uh, township uh, official plan. Paul, do you want to clarify your comments? Uh, yes. Uh, am I still alive? Good. Uh, the confusion is if there's two OPs, and I don't think there is, but how can you close one part of the OP and you're having a future public meetings for the rest of the OP for the rest of the township. So I think that the Manette OP has to be open to scrutiny at future OP meetings. It's a little confusing because we apply the term for both. David, are you comfortable? I think I'm a little more clear. And uh, I think this has been discussed several times during the broader official plan review process. And you'll note a placeholder in that official plan. So the intention uh, is that this uh, draft official plan amendment would replace what's currently in the current uh, township official plan. And then at which time, uh, if council is ready to adopt and district approve the broader official plan amendment, uh, the current OPA 56 before you would be carried forward. Uh, but very technically speaking, I suppose Mr. Richards is correct, uh, you could approve this uh, and then it could still be open for discussion uh, at the broader uh, OP level, uh, but presumably in, in theory, the intention is to carry uh, this portion forward uh, in the new document if things go uh, smoothly. Thank you. That clarifies, okay. thank you. Very good. Thank you very much. And thank you, Mr. Richards for your uh, dedication to Manette. And I'm assuming by your communication method, you're referring to the Manette Coffee Club as the best way to get the message out. That's one of them. <laughs> but John Newton has a newsletter to 80 fam John Newton has a newsletter to 80 families. Okay. We that's we will two, continue that's to use all people. channels. Yeah. All channels appropriately. There we go. Thank you. We're gonna let Susan Eplett into the meeting and thank you, Paul. And then Lori Thompson, you're on deck. Okay, good morning, Susan. Susan, can you hear us? You're good to speak. Maybe your mic, your 
you can all hear me council can you not yes we can just susan who is uh using paul richard's computer there we go now we're good we just you're on mute susan if you can hear us there Thank we you. go over to you two minutes great great Where's yours uh my name is Susan Epplett, 50 Weyborn Crescent, Toronto, Ontario, and I'm speaking today on behalf of the MLA and Friends of Muskoka. I'll be spending my two minutes explaining some wording changes that we believe are needed, so the meaning of two important policies is completely clear. We unfortunately know what can happen on an appeal if the policies aren't clearly worded, so although the changes we suggest may seem minor, we think they are important clarifications to make even at this late stage of the process. The first clarification is in the three sections that describe the location of staff housing. It's not clear from the current wording that staff housing must be located in Manette. So we suggest that the last five words be moved earlier in the sentence. So it would read, quote, staff housing for the employees of the various businesses within the Manette Resort Village will be required within the Manette Resort Village as a condition of development. And we showed this change with highlighting in our letter to you yesterday. The second clarification is in the language describing development on steep slopes greater than 20% and less than 40% in section C1535. It's not clear from the current wording that the environment impact study shall be of a standard that is satisfactory to the township. And it's not clear how the servicing is to, is to be assessed. Since both of these points are clearly worded in the next section, which relates to sleep, steep slopes greater than 40%, we suggest that the wording from this next section be duplicated in C1535. Again, we showed these changes with highlighting in our letter to you yesterday. So finally, thank you to all of you, council members and Director Pink alike for the care and focus that you've brought to bring these policies to the finish line of your review. Almost there. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Susan. Um, Mr. Pink, did you want to comment a little bit about uh, those proposed changes, uh, staff housing uh, and the steep slope development in particular? Comments? I think the uh, only comments uh, through your worship, uh, I believe the changes to staff housing, certainly uh, I think that, that would be uh, make that a little more clear and, and beneficial. I don't uh, necessarily believe the steep slope policies, uh, the changes I think uh, to our satisfaction is, is fairly standard, but I don't see any major concerns with those changes uh, either. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Thank Appreciate you. it. And uh, Laurie Thompson, we'll bring you into the meeting at this particular point. Laura is apparently in the meeting, but muted, I'm told. Let's see. I don't see. There we go. There she is. Good afternoon. Can you see me? Over to you. Yep. Hi. Thank you very much. Laura um, okay. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. My name is Laurie Thompson, uh, One Stepping Stone Island, Lake Rosso. I just have one comment to make, but first I would like to sincerely thank council and staff for the time and concerted attention that you've dedicated to Manette over the past several years. Nick McDonald and David Pink have done yeoman's work, as have the Manette Joint Policy Review Steering Committee and the working group that followed. Thanks are also in order to the community, those who live in Manette and beyond, for caring so deeply about the outcome in Manette. And of course, if it were not for Mr. Goldhar, we would indeed be in a very different place today. So in addition to the comments made by, by my colleagues before me, I'd like to ask council to please consider adding some clarifying language to the section on building height, section C 1.4.2.3. I'm sure you're all well aware that the community is disappointed that 16 meter heights will be allowed in the net, particularly given the negative reaction of most to the current height of the Marriott Hotel. This permission may set a new precedent for elsewhere in the township as 14 meters is the current limit, even for urban areas. So we respectfully request that if you are not willing to reconsider allowing the 16 meters, that no building height be allowed to exceed the lower of 16 meters or the existing mature tree canopy, not either one or the other as it is currently worded in this draft MPA. So um, thank you very much for considering this request. 
Okay, thank you for that, Lori. Um, Mr. Pink, any comments specifically? There's provisions, I think, in the zoning bylaw uh, where the developer has asked for some potential exemptions regarding a wellness center. Um, I think would cap it at 16 meters. They potentially would like more, but certainly would be below the tree canopy in that area because of the back uh, drop in the area. But uh, David, what, where are we at with height right now and pot potential exemptions along the way? Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I, I think uh, we all know height was discussed at length uh, at the last uh, few meetings. Uh, and the last direction received from planning committee uh, as outlined in the staff report was to uh, limit height to 16 meters, but, uh, but do allow uh, a small number of, of small, small number of iconic or prominent buildings to exceed that. Uh, but upon further review uh, and approval by council, um, and that's the draft policy, uh, you know, ultimately it's obviously up to council as to whether you wish to make changes as, uh, as the delegate uh, commented, you may wish to hear from the, um, principal uh, stakeholder who's I think scheduled to speak uh, a little later they may have some comments in that regard and then you wish may wish to make a decision after hearing um, uh, both comments okay thank you for that I see Laura you put your hand back up um, where we landed last time was that uh, generally across the board is a, a 16 meter cap but we would allow some site-specific exemptions uh, for some iconic buildings uh, to be determined uh, in the zoning bylaw. Uh, are you okay with that language or you want a hard cap at 16 meters or lower, which was the lower tree canopy potentially is what you're suggesting? Yeah, uh, my, my suggestion is that it's the lower of the 16 meters or the natural tree canopy. Because as it reads right now, it seems to be either the lower of the 16 meters or the natural tree canopy, which to me um, grammatically means that you can choose either or. And so I think it should be the lower of does that make sense? Okay, I understand what you're saying. I guess the question on the table is, generally speaking, if I uh, read the room last time we discussed this uh, OPA with committee, uh, we were in agreement with a general 16 meter cap or tree cover, not to exceed one or the other, but there is going to be a provision within the zoning bylaw to allow for some iconic buildings. And are you okay, let me just be very specific, with some iconic buildings to potentially be above the 16 meters? not to exceed the tree canopy in totality. Right, well, are you asking that question? Well, I, I guess specifically, I, I, I am asking you the specifics because what, what I heard today is the lower of 16 meters or tree canopy, which would mean at maximum a 16 meter height. Okay, However- No, mm -hmm. no I know, I understand about the exemptions and, um, and we're happy with the exemptions for one or two iconic buildings, you know, provide you know, to the satisfaction of the township um, during the master development planning process. That's that's OK, but it's it's more the wording of the of the either of the either or. Okay. It seems to be an or rather than lower of the two of them. That's that's our main concern. It's just literally the understand, wording. understand that. And we will let uh, drink or pink uh, comment on that. Uh, not at this particular point. We have uh, another delegation, and then we're also going to hear from uh, Paula Bustard from uh, Smart Centers as well, just to circle back, and then we can uh, potentially go forward with either proposed amendments or as is. Councillor Evers, you had a comment? Uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, while we're on heights and that, on um, C1544, with the 15-minute... Uh, the meter waterfront uh, and that the uh, the wellness center and I just want to make sure actually um, if it's included in the shoreline structures if it's going to be uh, higher or or 16 meters it should be back at least the uh, 20 meters and that or a, a lower building and that so we don't uh, and, and I get the, uh, the, the the shoreline built up too much and I don't know why that was uh, actually included in there, but uh, shoreline structures, open decks, uh, minor accessory structures, and then uh, they said, including the, the wellness center. I just don't know what their plans are, are for that. Thank you. Thanks for that comment. And uh, I believe Paula Bustard is also probably listening to these delegations at this point, but we will circle back to that because we will circle back obviously to height 
um, after everyone's delegation as we try to uh, move this forward. So thank you, Councillor Edwards, and thank you, Laurie, uh, for your support of the committee uh, as we've worked for the past few years. Uh, next delegate is uh, Lisa Van Exen. If I said that properly, bring Lisa into the meeting room. Anybody else hear this ding ding? I'm not quite sure what that is that goes on or where it's coming from. That's when people come in. Oh, it's the front door opening to allow people in. There we go. Uh, Lisa, you are in, I understand. There we go. I will turn the floor over to you. We've got two minutes and welcome to town council. And your two minutes will start when we figure out how to unmute you or you figure out how to unmute yourself. There we go. Still cannot hear. There we go. Now you're. I'm, I'm here. I was just turning off my uh, my YouTube. Sorry okay. There that. we go. We'll turn okay. it over to you, and you. Uh, you've got two minutes. Thank you. Okay. Very good. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. My name is Lisa Van Exen. I'm at 25 Kildeer Crescent in Toronto, and I'm here today representing the Bruce Lake Family Association. Um, first of all, on behalf of our association, we would like to thank all of you for extending the protection of water quality from Wallace Bay to include Bruce Lake. We're very happy that you appreciate the potential impact that a development of this size could have on a lake of our size, given its size and proximity. And we really appreciate Director Pink's um, support in that, as well as Friends of Muskoka and uh, Muskoka Lakes Association and the um, Royal Muskoka Island. So today I was going to speak to two points that the Friends of Muskoka and the MLA had made. I'm not going to speak to the first one. It was regarding building height, which you have just gone through in detail. So I will go straight to point two, which actually, and when I say point two, it's point two of the letter that Friends of Muskoka and the MLA sent. And it goes directly to uh, the comments that Councillor Edwards just made. And this, this point is related to the setbacks and vegetated buffer. And our association would concur with the Friends of Muskoka and the MLA that the flexibility for the 20 meter shoreline setback and 15 meter vegetative buffer should only be applied to recreational amenities and other waterfront related amenities. So as Councillor Edward pointed out, as it's currently drafted, the wellness center could be right at the water's edge with potentially no height restriction or certainly 16 meters and then it may qualify for this exemption. So in our view, that seems to fly somewhat in the face of logic to allow a wellness center to be built in a manner that would be extremely unwell for the lake um, being so close and tall. I think we should keep in mind that if people are gonna travel to this area to visit a wellness center, the surroundings that provide the wellness are at least as important, if not more important than the actual physical built form and they must be protected. This impact could be mitigated by incorporating the changes that are proposed by the MLA and the FOM in their letter. If the wellness center that's built within the 20 meter setback area, if you continue to allow that, be at quite least I'm low, gonna get up if you yep, can just be only it. two stories high. This will reduce the built form along the lake and protect the health of the lake which is exactly what the Wellness Center is depending on. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. I'm just gonna to turn to Mr. Pink a little bit to talk about the front yard setbacks and exemptions. Um, and I'm not sure if the language is appropriate or not. My understanding that we were granting exemptions for pathways and walkways and recreational from a, a close setback, but certainly not uh, in the front yard to be able to do a 70 foot high building. David, maybe the language isn't exactly appropriate, but maybe help us understand where we're at. Um, thank you, uh, uh, Your Worship. The, the direction uh, as noted in the staff report and the minutes was uh, from planning committee was to, uh, in regards to height allow, as we discussed, a maximum 60 meter height uh, across Manette, uh, but allow consideration of several prominent or iconic buildings to exceed that. With respect to the front yard, uh, the, the previous draft uh, did have a limitation uh, to not allow uh, anything other than those recreational type uses, shoreline structures. 
structures within the front yard set by the water. Uh, we heard from uh, the principal proponent, Ms. Bustard, uh, requesting some flexibility, and that was the direction from planning committee to uh, put that flexibility in the draft, and that's the draft you have uh, before you. Uh, from my perspective, I'm not opposed to, um, I think the suggestion made is, is reasonable, uh, that if uh, the wellness center is permitted within the front yard, perhaps the limit on height is, is not an unreasonable request. Uh, but as I said, we may wish to hear from Ms. Bustard. Uh, she may have comments uh, in that regard. Uh, and then um, again, available to answer any questions or be interested to hear the, the debate and direction. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. And thank you, Lisa, for your comments. Uh, and uh, for everyone else who's commented today, uh, greatly appreciate it. We'll have an opportunity to discuss in a moment. I don't see any other invited uh, delegations. The only one uh, that I will turn to is uh, Paula Bustard, representing Smart Centers and Mitch Goldhar. And we'll bring Paula into the meeting. Um, and uh, I'm going to give Paula a little bit of latitude beyond the two minutes, I think, just to kind of uh, dial along. She's also technically would have five minutes because she was an invited guest anyway. So... I see a camera turning on. Good afternoon, Paula. Welcome. Good morning, uh, or uh, good afternoon, everyone. Sorry, uh, Director Pink was speaking uh, on the delay, so I'm not sure if there was a question or if I'm just being brought in for my uh, my two minutes. Not a problem. We are bringing you in right now for your, actually, you have five minutes. You were invited delegation. Um, so if you want to sort of uh, talk about some of the potential conversation that we've had here today, uh, happy to get your take on the situation, what you're agreeable or not, and uh, your overall take on the development. So thank you. Wonderful. So thank you very much, Paula Bustard, uh, representing Cleveland South. Uh, and again, I want to thank everyone here and the community and friends of Muskoka and everyone who's participated for, for many years now in, in bringing this uh, OPA forward. Uh, I, I echo all the comments that have been made to date. I think we're very close. There's still a couple issues where I think there's, there's a little bit of disagreement. Um, as I've said to you on many occasions, you know, obviously we want to have a very light footprint on this development and, and I think we share the same goals and objectives. One of the concerns that I have just from a pure policy and implementation point of view is sometimes the overly prescriptive language of some of these policies doesn't actually result in a better development. You start shoehorning development and you're actually forcing a certain built form and site configuration. Um, and, and so my some of my remaining concerns is the universal 20 meter setback. Uh, I know there's just been a discussion about that. I think if there's policy language at the OP level that allows for some exceptions, then it allows for it to get looked at at the zoning implementation stage in a much more detailed site specific manner. Uh, so I still have concerns about the universal 20 meter setback. Um, I also still am concerned about the, uh, the increase from 20% to 40% in the last draft of the OPA for the use limited areas. I know that it has been clarified that development isn't prohibited, but it does speak to a general provision of maintaining vegetation. And again, um, we want this development to have a light footprint. And by creating a lot of impediments through setbacks and restriction areas, you're actually resulting in creating higher densities and a tighter built form in certain areas of the site. Uh, so I'd ask you to reconsider those. Lastly, um, the one of the changes that was made uh, spoke to landowners responsible for the cost of the municipal infrastructure being major proponents. I'm not sure what the definition of major proponents is. I'm not sure if the intent that's just us or us and other other uh, major landowners such as the Marriott and Legacy. Um, I know there was a discussion at the last meeting about individual landowners, but I'm not sure what the, the intent of the wording major proponents is. And I just asked for clarification on that. Um, lastly, um, public access. I know that what's written in the documentation or the OPA right now doesn't explicitly mandate a public access, but it does open the door to it. And, and this has been a private property for over 150 years. I do have very significant concerns about a broad policy mandating public access. Certainly there's no intent to close the marina or to restrict normal commercial enterprises as happening on this property, but you don't mandate through policy public access for any commercial property in every single location. And I think that's what in turn, it'll turn into public easements. So I do uh, have significant concerns about that wording. Um, and what that means for the implementing zoning. Uh, so I'm happy to answer any questions. I thank you again for your time. Paula, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Pink, I'm assuming you obviously were listening to that and uh, have noted uh, Paula's concerns. I believe you guys have been uh, discussing or speaking outside of the Zoom call uh, in preparation for today. Um, Council, Number one, we've been at uh, the morning for about an hour and a half. Um, we've heard a bunch of uh, little tweaks and changes as recommended. 
Uh, Mr. Pink, maybe we'll get you to turn your camera on and, and going to try and think of a potential path forward here right now. And that would be that we're going to take maybe a 10 or 15 minute break. Um, maybe you could summarize in your words some of the little changes that you would like to see or potentially um, could be implemented. Some of them you said that you could uh, comment from. I don't think uh, there's anybody on council that's going to say, no, that's absolutely wrong from a public input perspective that we've heard some some of the delegations. And I think that goes on two sides, both, both from those people in opposition who are trying to put more restrictions on and also trying to understand Ms. Bustard's uh, comments and concerns. And maybe, David, you could come back, uh, let's say, again, 10 or 15 minute break and sort of summarize what you would think if there were going to be some minor amendments to this as we went forward, how we might uh, want to deal with them. Is that okay for you from a timing perspective to give 10 or 15 minutes? What's your thoughts on timing? I think I can, in 10, 15 minutes, summarize uh, some potential changes, whether I can craft uh, a clear, explicit resolution uh, with all those changes. Uh, that might have to come a little later uh, in the meeting. I'd rather not uh, rush it too much, but I could certainly uh, sort of summarize, uh, I think, what we've heard and what... Uh, uh, where we may need some ultimately council direction as to whether those changes um, are agreed to or not. Okay, thank um, you for that. Um, I, sorry, if I, I guess if I could, I, I don't know if uh, Ms. Bustard uh, was able to listen uh, with the delay on, on YouTube, but there has been, I guess, some requests from the previous speakers to uh, limit the height of the wellness center within the 20 meter setback, uh, still allow potentially it to exceed uh, the 16 meters, but within 20 meters, uh, a restriction on that. And I didn't know if you, you wish to comment. Uh, I think we were discussing that as you were coming into the, into the meeting. Paula. Um, I would just cautiously say that I, I would prefer not to, and to encumber the site with any more restrictive policies without understanding the unintended consequences. Certainly it's not our intention to build, uh, you know, a 16 meter building with zero setback. That's never the intention, but I will remind everyone, we have to go through a very robust zoning exercise and site plan. Everything is going to be coming back to council. So nothing that appropriate would ever be supported by council. So I would prefer not to get into a stepping provision right now, not understanding what the, the site configuration, the setbacks and the designs are. Um, but not because I have the intent to build, you know, 16 meters with zero setback. That's not the case. But again, I just feel like um, arbitrary policies such as that might have unintended consequences. Okay, point noted. Um, uh, I think that will probably uh, be probably a significant point of debate and contention that, you know, if you're going to be inside that uh, uh, 66 foot buffer, uh, there really is no rationale to go to 16 meters or above. Um, and again, if you're going to ask for exemptions to that behind that, I think is probably more appropriate, but, uh, we'll let you digest that over the next 15 minutes if, as well. Uh, so council, I'm going to suggest we take a break right now until three o'clock and we will come back and have let uh, Mr. Pink summarize some potential changes. Okay. We're on recess. Thank you.
Hey, Council, we're just waiting for uh, Mr. Pink to uh, get back to us as he's sort of the cornerstone of our next discussion. Peter. I'm ready. And your microphone's on, David. Okay. I think we are back. Apparently, Mr. Pink is ready. And uh, I think we have quorum. Let's wait for Councillor Mazan. Um, for those who are back joining us in, we've spent the last uh, 45 minutes or so discussing Manette OPA and uh, some proposed changes. We've been at this uh, for well over a year now and trying to put together an official plan amendment for the village of Manette. Um, from a process perspective, again, we will uh, potentially move some things forward to the district here. The district may make some more tweaks. They would come back to us if there's anything. Um, so there are still opportunities to make small little revisions and tweaks going forward. But I'll turn to Mr. Pink to try and summarize this morning. Um, and then we can kind of chime in on, do we agree with uh, where Mr. Pink's going or disagree? David. Thank you, Worship. I'll do my very best uh, to summarize what I thought I heard from all those speakers today. I apologize if, uh, if I mischaracterize anything, but uh, from what I heard, um, the first request actually emanated uh, from myself is in regards to the JW Marriott and the Legacy Cottages property. Uh, in particular, section C1624I, uh, uh, the revisions made uh, to be consistent with the rest of the resort village uh, limits the maximum unit size on those two properties for new units uh, to the 850 square feet. Uh, that was not the intention to uh, limit the maximum unit size, but to uh, limit their unit their equivalent uh, unit size, if you recall um, earlier, uh, much earlier discussions uh, that any unit under 850 would be considered one, uh, any size over 850 would then be considered in multiples depending on how large. Uh, so staff would suggest that, that clarification uh, be added as it certainly wasn't the intent to limit those two properties uh, to those sizes, but their equivalent uh, unit sizes. Uh, and then of course, a corresponding uh, reference in the unit definition to that policy uh, as it does to the other two. Uh, so that was the first. Uh, the second request I believe was from uh, Ken Pierce uh, and it was to provide uh, for some flexibility in the use provisions uh, and in particular section C1618 and C1628 uh, to add generally uh, and including instead of in accordance with I don't have any um, objections uh, to those changes. They seem uh, relatively straightforward. Uh, his second request for Mr. Pierce was to add immediate family to the definition of a unit owner. Again, I don't have any uh, objections uh, to that change. Uh, the fourth request uh, was from Paul Richards. Uh, I believe it was to delete the second sentence of C1628. Uh, for B. Uh, that sentence allows um, perhaps uh, some flexibility is the best way to describe it with respect to on-site management. Um, while I look for council's direction, um, I don't know if I necessarily would recommend deleting uh, the sentence. It, uh, I think as we all know when we uh, travel abroad, there's various different forms uh, and characteristics of resorts. Uh, and in particular, uh, this will function as a resort village. And I don't know if we want to um, uh, not provide for any uh, type of flexibility when it comes to on-site management. I think the first sentence is clear, but the sentence, the second sentence does allow uh, some factoring in of the characteristics of the individual lot in question or the resort uh, to allow a bit of flexibility. Uh, it's quite prescriptive for an OP policy uh, already. Um, so I would suggest that perhaps that sentence uh, remain. Uh, the fifth request, I believe, was from Susan Epplett. Uh, it was in regard to staff housing uh, to clarify that the staff housing is required uh, within the resort village. I believe it largely does, but I, 
think her grammatical change to move that uh, slightly forward uh, is a good one. I would agree uh, with that slight revision. Um, the sixth request also from Ms. Eplett uh, was in regards to uh, steep slopes. Um, and in particular, add uh, that it uh, any environmental impact study be to the satisfaction of the township. I'm certainly fine with that change. Uh, again, I don't, uh, it's necessarily necessary, but uh, no concerns with that. Um, also suggested some changes with respect to stipulating explicitly that a servicing report uh, can be required by the township. Again, I, I think the current policies would allow us to require whichever studies we deem necessary. So I don't necessarily think that's uh, required. Uh, I don't think that changes. Uh, really needed. Also, um, the intention is to obviously service uh, the resort village with municipal uh, services. So um, the I think the typical concerns we see with steep slopes and private sewage disposal systems uh, should not be as prevalent, prevalent in this uh, community. Um, the seventh request, I believe, was from Laurie Thompson and Lisa Van Exen uh, with respect to uh, building height, and that was to make it clear that uh, throughout uh, the resort village, that it would be limited to 16 meters and the existing mature tree canopy as opposed to or. I'm certainly fine with that. I don't believe um, it, uh, there should be a sort of wiggle room there to allow uh, other general buildings throughout the, the village to exceed the tree canopy. That's a fairly standard requirement throughout our OP. Um, they also made the secondary request to limit the wellness center uh, within uh, any part of the wellness center that happens to be within the 20 meter setback of the high water mark to be two stories or less. Um, again, I'm not uh, opposed uh, to that change. It does seem reasonable to me. Uh, you did hear Ms. Bustard's concerns with the um, very detailed prescriptive nature of such a policy, um, but, uh, uh, but I didn't hear an objection uh, or an intention to, to exceed that height. Um, again, I, it appears reasonable to me. Uh, and then uh, the last requests uh, were from uh, Ms. Bustard um, with respect to the uh, universal 20 meter setback, that is fairly standard language uh, in other designations of our official plan to require buildings to be 20 meters uh, from the water. I believe the current policies do allow for uh, consideration of those buildings that currently exist. Um, with that said, I'm not uh, necessarily uh, opposed to some flexibility uh, perhaps along the lines of uh, where soil or terrain or other conditions exist, uh, that consideration can be given to, to buildings within. Uh, there may be some cases um, where the optimal building site is not at 20 meters, uh, and that type of language uh, does exist in our, in our current OP. Um, Ms. Bustard also had a question, I uh, believe more of a clarification question on who the major proponents are, uh, and some clarification in that regard. I believe the, certainly the intention uh, is that uh, Ms. Bustard's client is certainly a principal or major proponent, uh, as well as the owner of the JW Marriott, as they were previously under the same ownership and envisioned to be in the full service area, not in the future service area. Um, with that said, I think my suggestion in that regard is perhaps to leave it the language as is, and given that municipal services and the corresponding agreement as to uh, uh, paying for that capital infrastructure and maintaining it will be a district responsibility uh, and perhaps we can leave uh, that to later discussions with the district if clarification is needed as to uh, who are the major proponents but it certainly again the intention was the owner of the JW Marriott uh, and the Penguin Group and then I believe her last uh, concern or question was in regard to uh, public access uh, and uh, what was referred to there, there's uh, several policies, C1445, C175D. Um, there will be opportunities through this process to acquire uh, parkland for the municipality. I believe the policies are currently worded certainly to uh, consider uh, the municipality obtaining access uh, to the, um, the waterfront. However, it's certainly, um, it's not mandated. Uh, in the policies. It uses language such as if desired or where deemed appropriate. I think the current uh, wording uh, is acceptable. Uh, however, uh, I don't think I would be uh, vehemently opposed if council uh, wished to include um, a slight uh, tweak to indicate that 
requiring public access is not mandated, um, but can be uh, considered. I believe that was Ms. Uh, Bustard's request. Um, and I hope that summarizes uh, what we heard this morning and provides uh, you with a uh, brief insight into, into my thoughts on each and happy to answer any more specific questions you have on any of those matters. Thank you. Okay, thank you, David. So uh, if just if I can sort of summarize pretty much uh, most of what people have asked for, you've been able to add, tweak, change slightly. Um, the uh, in the front 20 yard, 20 meter setback, um, a two story height, would that be sort of an existing, I think we have 35 feet right now, is what's our general waterfront zone for um, properties. Would that be a similar height when we consider two story? Um, and obviously behind that, they could uh, use their iconic building as required, but in the front yard, um, what height do we just call it two story? What's your recommendation there specifically? I'm gonna have one more comment and we can move on. Uh, again, uh, similar to our previous discussions, we're, you know, I don't think there's a requirement to put a strict figure in the OP. We're becoming quite prescriptive. It is typically left to the zoning bylaw. Uh, you are correct in the waterfront uh, residential zones of the township. We do allow a 35 uh, foot height limit. Uh, it is typically two stories, but we do see some two story with a walkout basement able to be accommodated in, in a 35 foot height uh, limitation. It depends, of course, on the slopes. Um, I believe fairly well as to height to two stories within 20 meters, 35, uh, certainly maximum height limit in a, in a future zoning bylaw. Two story, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna turn it over to Councillor Edwards and then I have an idea for a path forward. Alan. Yes, uh, and uh, maybe uh, Paula Buster could answer this. Um, it's saying about everything being private as far as the beach goes. With all these extra houses that are not on the, 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 the waterfront, what access will they have to, to the uh, beach or any else like that? Will they have to go to different parks in the area? Like what, what are the actual plans for that? I'm not sure if Paul is still with us or not. Um, she's in the waiting room, we'll bring her back in. But uh, I believe what would be before us today, as Mr. Pink said, is we can ask for some parkland dedication. Um, yeah. We create our parks, but uh, whether or not they get access to the water, that's another story. Paula, if you've been listening to that conversation, the question right now is the public access. Yep. Um, and we realize that uh, in the Cleveland South property currently, there is not waterfront public access. Councillor Ebers' question, if we're creating a bunch of homes, would you be providing some waterfront access or we just expect them all to look at rocks and trees? No, I mean, there, there's obviously going to be a commercial component. Uh, the majority of this is going to be a commercial and, and there'll be beach areas and, and, and that in itself as being a commercial property is going to be publicly accessible. What my concern is, is a blanket policy about public access through the site for the general public. Um, you know, we obviously have to oper operate it as a private property and as a commercial entity and have to be able to control the property. I understand what Director Pink said. Um, if through our zoning, we determine uh, either parkland or other arrangements of city and detailed easements through that uh, process, that's totally understandable. But I just think at an OP level, just a general mandate for public access through the property is, uh, is a dangerous precedent to set. But yeah, there's no intention, obviously, right now, there's no public easements through the property, but uh, uh, the, the marina and all the components of it flow freely for anyone visiting the site. Sounds forever set. Satisfy your comment? Uh, yeah, it, it's just a case that I I, I just wondered with, with putting so much residential in there, if somebody wants to go for a swim, where do they go? And that, that and that, do they going to have to drive down to Hannah Park or up in no, the sea? No, no, absolutely. Sorry to clarify, Councillor. If if it, if we do build the residential components in there, it is understood that uh, that they would have access to the waterfront. Good. That's all yeah. I want to know. Thank you very much, Thank you. Paula. And thank you've you. done a great job, by the way. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. So, Councillor Roberts, let me just uh, summarize that. I mean, uh, we're asking and seeking public access, depending on the development. Um, Director Pink had made a recommendation that uh, public access is encouraged, but not mandated. Maybe a slight tweak to the language along that way. Um, does that satisfy 
Okay, David, you're okay with those words? I think that was your final comment of Paul is it uh, access but not mandated. I'm gonna go to Councillor Kelly. Uh, thank you, and through you, uh, let me just say, we have really moved, well, not we, but this thing has really moved a long, long way towards, uh, towards closure. I think we're really close. I had six issues uh, that really four of them were drafting issues. Two of them are my inability to really grasp the concept. Um, and so uh, I think the drafting issues have been covered off. I was worried about the staff housing issue. Uh, the, the building height, I think David is, uh, uh, Director Pink has appropriately uh, dealt with the lower of 16 meters of the tree canopy. Um, commercial use that uh, Mr. Pierce raised and unit owner that Mr. Pierce raised have been addressed. <clears throat> I, I really think we're, you know, we're to use a football analogy here. We're uh, uh, we're first down and uh, goal to go on the three yard line. I don't want to mess it up now. Um, I really think it's important that these last few uh, uh, amendments or proposed amendments get incorporated into one more draft with a red line only on those changes. Uh, I will specifically focus on those changes and make sure that I'm comfortable that they reflect the reality of what I think we've agreed to. Um, my, my concern is we are so close that we're reaching for the finish, finish line, and this is where we can mess it up. Words really do matter. The language that we choose really does matter. If it's at all ambiguous, if, if it's all at all, uh, uh, you know, uh, if it's all just difficult to understand or ambiguous in any way, it becomes unenforceable. And then we wind up in the same position if we have to go to a LPAT type scenario um, that we've been in before, where we have language just not quite there. It sounds like we've got it nailed. I think I need to see it. The, the one thing that I'm still stuck on, and somebody can help me, I have no idea what an iconic building is. Uh, I've Googled it. Uh, I just don't get it. I don't understand that. So as a result, I'm challenged to understand what can happen and in what circumstances something can happen inside the setback zone. And I'm also confused about how I would recognize the building which qualifies for excess height, unless it has a label iconic on it. I, I just, uh, to me, that is so, uh, either there's industry jargon that eludes me or uh, that is so nebulous that I don't know how we would ever be able to call one way or the other sufficient to go and enforce it. And so I think that needs, uh, I think that needs a little better uh, explanation so that everybody can understand it. And, and maybe I'm just the only one, but that's, those are my comments. Okay, thank you for those, uh, Councillor Kelly. I, I think uh, what uh, Director Pink has recommended up front is that anything inside the front yard setback of 20 meters uh, is limited to two stories maximum. So there is no iconic building height exemption within the front yard setback. So I think he's already covered that one off for us. Um, and what it would be, there is still would, in the proposed, if I'm not mistaken, Mr. Pink, a 16 meter height setback unless a proponent comes and says this is a feature uh, a mini CN tower, if you will. That would be an iconic building that I would consider for the city of Toronto, and I hope we're not going to build one of those. But uh, if there was some uh, small building, part of a wellness center, part of the old Cleveland's House Hotel that uh, lended itself some way along the line to go to 18 meters or something along the lines, I think that's where, but generally speaking, the language in the OP would be a 16 meter cap at this particular point, unless they could demonstrate its need. And I think that's more the flexibility of demonstration versus out seeing anything. So I uh, hope that's answered uh, your concerns as that goes forward. I'll go to Councillor Zavitz, Jagowitz and Roberts and welcome back Councillor Jagowitz. Well, thank you, sir. And through you, I guess I have uh, three things very quickly. Um, I heard our, my good friend, uh, Councillor Kelly, I think we've got a deal. I love those words. Uh, this has been a long, arduous task. Uh, but at the end of the day, a good one. And I, I, I want to champion both, both sides of this where we become one almost. Uh, Paula, if I might, uh, you use the words very light footprint. Thank you for that. Um, I, I don't want to say I'm going to hold you to that, but I'll be watching as many will. And we're going to be seeing you. And so, so thank you for coming to the table with an open mind. 
I also want to uh, just uh, shower a little bit of praise on, on David Pink. Wow, I know what it's like to be in that seat. And David, you have uh, flown this plane like a, a crazy man. And I, I think it's amazing that you're able to keep, to keep it together, keep all this information assembled. We're so very close and I will be supportive of this going forward. Thank you. Some may consider Mr. Pink a kamikaze pilot, so to speak, in flying this airplane. Uh, Councillor Jagowitz. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I apologize for missing the first part of the meeting. Coming into this meeting, I had three points. Uh, I've missed parts of it. Uh, so I just, uh, if you would just allow me to mention my three points and see if they already have been resolved. The first one had to do with section C14.3.3, and it's that section that talks about the, the total unit count of 2020. And added to that was which shall include the number of units in the RC3 and RC4. And I assume that means shall not limited to, but include. And I assume that was added not to say it only includes those, but they are included also. So if staff would just look and make sure that that wording means that the 2020 is for all of the units anywhere on Schedule C. Cindy. Mr. Pink, do you want to answer that question? And I know that uh, Councillor Jacobs had two other comments. That's correct. That's all buildings, uh, Councillor Jacobs. So as long as the wording reflects that, because when it says shall include, it should say maybe shall include, but not, not be limited to. Okay. My, my second point uh, has to do with C1614 and 24, that the similar wordings in two sections in the deal with staff housing. And um, the wording to me is awkward. It says staff housing for the employees of the various businesses in the net resort village will be required as a condition of development within the Manette resort village. It sounds like it's a condition of development within the Manette resort village. I think that within the resort village should be ahead and it should say will be required within the Manette Resort Village as a condition of development. I assume that sentence is, is intended to mean that, that the staff housing shall be within the Resort Village. Is that correct? Mr. Pink has already, I think, commented on that. You must have missed that because he is amending the wording to- He's amending that. I, thank correct. you. Then the third one is again two sections, C1.6.14B and .2B. And that deals with on-site management. And <clears throat> the wording there, to me, is very fuzzy. My understanding of it was to be that there should be in-person management, should be available on-site in order to respond to complaints, deals with emergencies, and assist guests and visitors at all times the resort is occupied. That phrase appears to be missing. Has that been dealt with? Uh, so, Councillor Jagwitz, again, we uh, had uh, Mr. Richards request and discuss the on site management. Mr. Pink uh, has suggested that the existing uh, provisions within Legacy will remain, um, but there may be some smaller resorts and there would be a little bit of flexibility. Um, generally speaking, you're correct that uh, on site management is there, but uh, he did comment that uh, the OP in particular is written with a little bit of flexibility and we can always tighten it up in the zoning bylaw. David, did you want to comment further? That's uh, correct, Your Worship. That uh, was discussed. I guess what I would note is that's there's no changes to this draft uh, from the previous. This wasn't discussed at the last uh, change. Uh, ultimately, if council wishes to delete the second sentence, I think uh, uh, Councillor Jagowitz is raising the same concerns as the delegate, uh, Mr. Richards. You know, certainly we can delete uh, that sentence, um, but I'm not particularly opposed to it. It just allows for some consideration. Mm -hmm. I think we can all appreciate that um, resorts around the world these days are come in very uh, different forms and, and functions. And this just allows uh, for some flexibility, uh, you know, should the need uh, arise rather than um, uh, be extremely prescriptive. But again, I look for uh, direction from council. Supplementary? Supplementary. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, my memory of it is that it was it was raised at the last meeting, 
it just didn't make it into the changes. And I would appreciate if that last sentence was struck um, because it, it's one of those that you can drive a transport truck through. And, and uh, I really think that uh, uh, a resort requires on-site uh, on -site management. So that would be my request that, that removing that last sentence would satisfy me. And, and those are my, my three points. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to hold that uh, last particular point of on-site events with the other two, and we can chime in on that as uh, council. Councillor Roberts. Thank you, um, Chair, and through to uh, Mr. Pink. Um, I'm following the same vein as um, as, as Councillor Jagwick. Um, I recall talking about lockouts at the previous meeting. Um, it did not, uh, the, the, our comments on lockouts were not mentioned on page 123 on notable changes. And um, I, I, I do recall that uh, something would be added to the appendices. And I think Councillor Jagwood had another example that would be on the, um, in the appendices. Uh, is, is that someplace that I've missed? Uh, Mr. Pink, uh, would we deal with lockouts in that in uh, uh, zoning and or in actual use agreements specifically with the properties? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, that's correct. It would typically be left to those more prescribed processes. Uh, maybe just to clarify uh, to member uh, Jerry Lewitz and Roberts, I'm not uh, sorry if I uh, implied as if those matters weren't discussed, but I think the clear uh, there was clear direction as noted in the minutes uh, as to what uh, changes ultimately planning committee did direct the consultants and staff to make, and those are the changes uh, made. Uh, if you could bear with me, I can quickly go through the lockout uh, um, if that's included in the definition section and, and provide a further response in a moment. Uh, we can do that. I, I guess the specifics from a, a lockout, uh, Mr. Pink, even if we did or didn't, um, is your preference to include specific wording in an official plan, which is very high level and very, very prescriptive, um, or would you rather deal with that again in a uh, condo use agreement and or zoning bylaw a little bit uh, further down as we get into a little more details about a specific type of development that may be going forward? Um, again, from a council perspective, remember, we're talking about a very high level document. Um, we've already got a ton of detail in here, uh, which is far more prescriptive than most OPs or OPAs, uh, which is definitely a benefit to the community. Um, but uh, a little bit of flexibility uh, I'll, would be my recommendation as we go forward. And again, uh, for those who haven't had an opportunity to go through a zoning bylaw, um, Buckle up your seatbelts because that's going to be where the uh, real uh, heavy lifting goes on and uh, we're going to work our way through that. So, David. Thank you, Your Worship. I, I would agree. I mean, that's a, quite a prescriptive detail and is typically left to uh, later documents. And I would echo your comments that uh, I appreciate the, um, the, the appreciation, I guess, uh, from everyone for this project, but really where the rubber will hit the road in a lot of respects will be the Zoning bylaw, which I'm sure will be forthcoming shortly, and uh, look forward to working with all of you and Ms. Bustard on on that in the community. So, thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Jagwitz. You have uh, another question. Yes, I just wanted to follow up on my last conversation, and uh, uh, Mr. Pink, you are correct. Um, I aired at the last meeting when you were getting a summary of the changes, uh, the change on um, on-site management. Um, I did not raise it and get it on your list, but I am now. And uh, that's, the, that's the last thing I have. And I appreciate if you might look at that. I also neglected, as I to say at this meeting, which I said at the last meeting, I'm very pleased with this process. I think this is gonna be a good development and we should move it forward. And I'm hoping you will, you'll accept this last change I'm asking for. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I want to deal with specifically with that one last change that uh, Councillor Jagowitz has brought up. Um, right now, there's a general provision that suggests on-site management, um, and that again in the official plan. Uh, but there is, as Director Pink has provided, some flexibility depending on the resort. Uh, and, and I guess I would look at it, let's assume this is a small, wholly owned, uh, four unit, quote unquote, resort. Um, do they have to have on-site management or could they manage their four units off-site? 
Um, I think generally speaking, we all want on-site when I've got a large 400 room hotel, definitely there's on-site management to deal with it. The legacy property obviously is going to follow their existing zoning in particular, and that would be managed accordingly. But um, where do we want to land on a super prescriptive official plan? Or again, as uh, Director Pink has suggested, maybe allowing some flexibility. Councillor Jagowitz would like no flexibility and uh, mandated of uh, all, all units within the Manette Village to have on-site management. Um, Councillor Evers, do you want to comment? Yeah, uh, we've heard loud and clear from, from the public. They want on-site management. Uh, there was um, Lakeside when there was use of staffing, all the problems they, they, they had with noise and, and everything else like that. On-site management would manage that uh, and that, and I think it should be left in. I, I would follow uh, Councillor Jackowitz on, on, on this. It should be left in. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Uh... Anybody opposed to having it or being a little more flexible? Anybody want to chime in on that at this point? Everybody, generally speaking, to uh, make it a little less flexible and more firm than on-site management through the all the rezoning. I'm getting a sense, Mr. Pink, that uh, on-site management is going to be a requirement. Councillor Jagowitz, any question? Yes, yeah, just a word of explanation. The, the sentence that's in there you can drive a truck through. It says, you know, and desired experience of a resort. If you want a phrase in there that there are options for a four uh, room resort or something, but, but that's the problem. Uh, you can build a 2000 room resort and fall and, and fall in there. So, so I think, I think it's appropriate to take it out. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, any other comments to where we're at right now? Okay, Mr. Pink, I'm gonna to turn to you. Um, I think we have some modifications, some amendments, and maybe you can explain the process right now. Uh, we would potentially be passing um, an OPA with some minor modifications, and I'd like you to put some language to those specifically as we've heard today. Um, I believe it would be going to the district and maybe sort of explain the process where it would happen there uh, I don't think it's uh, from this point, we're no longer in touch with it. I know that our district councillors, I think, would uh, certainly have a, an opportunity to debate about it and could make other further tweaks from a comment perspective. But David, maybe explain from a process. Um, you know, as uh, Councillor Kelly said, we're at the three yard line. Um, but uh, just because we attempt to pass it across doesn't mean that it's going to go across. And even though if it does have a touchdown, doesn't mean that we can't make more changes. David? Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, yes, my intention, uh, hopefully I'm able to craft a resolution uh, while the meeting continues. Uh, it uh, will be very explicit as to the precise changes we've agreed to uh, just now. Uh, those changes would then be made uh, to the draft and the complete record would then be forwarded uh, to the District of Muskoka for consideration of approval. It's likely uh, that staff would determine that that's a uh, district council decision uh, to make and there will be opportunities through that process uh, if any modifications any significant modifications are uh, suggested or recommended they would likely um, approach uh, the township uh, to uh, participate in those discussions and certainly I can bring those uh, any correspondence I receive back to uh, planning committee or council and there will be an opportunity to uh, as I say make potentially some more modifications before the district finally uh, considers approval of a of an OPA. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Pink, I'm going to recommend at this point uh, that Councillor Kelly ask a question. <laughs> Councillor Kelly, as you put your hand up. Thank you very much. I, I, I have to tell you that on a deal this big, uh, I don't for the life of me understand how we get another shot at tweaking this thing. Um, I don't expect that the district will have as much um, vested of a vested interest in the outcome to spend the time and energy on this that we have. Um, and I would think that before, before I'm ready to submit it uh, with my approval, I'm going to have to look at it and read it and think about it. Now we can do that today, but I, I really don't think we should leave anything to chance. It's not big structural issues. To me, it's the, it's the finesse points of language that we need to know specifically picks up uh, the agreement that we think we have reached, 
uh, and makes it specific enough to be actionable, to be enforceable. Uh, that's my only open concern. And um, so unless we can incorporate these changes and get it distributed real quick, I'm, I'm having trouble thinking that I can support it until I've read it. That's all. Okay, thank you. Councilor Kelly, just a reminder that uh, as we had the initial um, Manette Steering Committee, the district was part of that committee. Um, and any changes uh, or contemplation, we're not turning this over specifically and letting the district dictate. The district will always give a nod to the local municipality of which we have four very strong and very capable individuals to make further changes as required. So we will have an opportunity individually, just as the public will have, to make language changes and understand uh, all the contemplated changes. Uh, I'll be honest, my personal concern is we could change the words. And as some came through, we decided there's new words today. And next week, there'll be new words. And next month, there'll be new words. Um, and uh, we have incorporated, and I believe Mr. Pink is going to incorporate all of the public's comments in tweaking words in this particular case. I haven't heard much objection uh, in this specific language. So let's see the proposed resolution that Mr. Pink comes back with in the next half hour. Um, and then uh, hopefully we can move it forward. If you choose not to, that's your choice as well. So thank you for that. And David, thank you. Uh, and to your staff, uh, Nick, uh, I'm not sure Mr. McDonald, he is uh, hopefully on the call. Uh, and also to Paul and all the delegates. Uh, thank you. This has uh, been a significant process. Um, it's not done. Uh, this is just another step along the process and the district will want certain tweaks and changes at which point we will have to comment on and we will be able to comment on through our district councillors. So um, that's all that's happening potentially today. So David, we're going to let you turn your camera off for the next half hour or so and uh, see what kind of language you can craft for us uh, for a potential resolution. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, let's move on. Uh, we're going to move on to item... Five, eight, number eight, senior management reports, I think is where we're going, if I'm not mistaken. And we have a report from our chief building officer, Mr. Snyder, uh, regarding appointment of municipal employees as building inspector. If I'm not mistaken, I'm in the right place. I don't know what number that is, but Mr. McDonald, you here? I think it was on the supplementary agenda. Nick, or who's coming in? Oh, just a routine appointment. Yeah. Okay, let me read the resolution then. How about that? Um, oh, I jumped ahead. I did not get to go. I, your COVID framework, I apologize, Mr. CIO. I went right to by. Where am I going here? That's in bylaws? Yeah. I'm going to skip that, change that. We're going to back up to our opening um, CIO report from the CIO proposed opening facilities usage. So, Mr. CIO, Mr. Hammond, over to you. Thanks, Your Worship. Uh, good afternoon, members of council. <clears throat> so as, as members of council are aware, um, the province updated its roadmap to reopen in October with a new plan entitled the, the Plan to Safely Reopen Ontario and Manage COVID-19 for the Long Term. Uh, it's quite a, quite a mouthful there. So that new plan sets forward some key dates to loosen public health restrictions based on monitoring of public health indicators. Um, and the release of that plan has caused staff to take a review or a look at uh, our reopening plan. And it's interesting, um, I just received an email this afternoon from the province and they have halted any reopening plans or, or capacity or loosening of capacity restrictions for higher risk settings. So if uh, one was interested in attending a food or drink establishment with dance facilities such as nightclubs, wedding receptions and meeting event spaces where there's dancing, strip clubs and or sex clubs and bathhouses, those, um, those venues, uh, the capacity restrictions are still in place. Uh, so that said, um, not that any of those apply to the municipality in terms of venues that we offer, uh, but we have updated our reopening plan and uh, it's attached as an appendix to this report. Um, Mr. Becking is prepared to provide a, a high level overview of uh, the changes and uh, how they'll work in the various settings uh, should uh, uh, 
uh, council wish to hear further in that respect. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Mr. Hammond. Uh, Mr. Becking, anything you want to add to the report? I do have a resolution also. Uh, I think uh, the report uh, lays out probably far more detail than council's uh, particularly interested in, in terms of where we are and where we're heading. Um, it's going to be a situation where we're going to have to crawl, walk, run, uh, feel our way through it, and, um, and uh, we're proposing to do so. But if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Okay, thank you. Uh, any comments? Councillor Bridgman, then Councillor Hayes, and then Councillor Zavitz. Uh, thank you, Mayor Harding. Um, Mr. Becking, I'm not sure um, from your report, what, what are we looking at for the community centres at this point with, with some of the loosening? Can you help me out with that? And uh, particularly, Manette, I've had lots of, lots of people for from the Peninsula Rec Centre who would like to see it open more. So where are we in terms of that? Well, um, Your Worship, uh, this is a bit of a good news, bad news story. Uh, the good news is that the province has um, loosened the restrictions, which means that there are no capacity limits, um, save and except for wedding receptions and the like, uh, which... Uh, the province overturned this afternoon. But other than that, um, we're, we're open for business as long as people uh, are vaccinated and they wear their mask. And if they want to enjoy food or beverages, then they're going to have to be seated and, and served. Um, we can, um, because of some, some new guidance with respect to cleaning, we can open up to uh, two sessions per day uh, that's the good news. The bad news is that the province has tightened down the regulations with respect to uh, verification and validation of, of um, attendee status, uh, where previously that was um, allowed, well, it was unclear as to whether or not we could delegate that authority to the organizers. Uh, the uh, requirement has been uh, made it excruciatingly clear that it must be an employee of the corporation. This is where it creates difficulties for us because um, we are not staffing uh, those facilities on a regular basis. So henceforth, every event uh, that is, is sponsored in one of our facilities will have to be supervised by a staff member. Uh, our, our resources don't exist at the present time to cover that, um, but we are making uh, adjustments uh, as we speak in order to try and accommodate it. The same requirements apply to our arenas. And uh, we've already made, it, made those changes at, uh, at uh, Port Carling, and we will be incorporating those into our, uh, our uh, staffing arrangements for BALA. Okay. Uh, follow up Thank yep. you, Mayor Harding. So um, as I listened to you, um, Director Becking, uh, you know, the towns come to mind. Am I, I am assuming them that they have full-time staff in those facilities. So this having to have a staff on board is not a new requirement for them. I'm just trying to think of our community centers. Um, so what you're saying is we'd have to have a staff member there all the time. That's correct. And that's provincial legislation. Uh, yes, I, I, I spoke specifically to the vice president of the health unit, uh, Dr. Rebellato, and uh, he read to me a, a uh, directive from the chief medical officer of health that is explicit. It couldn't be more explicit in terms of what the expectation is. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Hayes. Thank you, and through you to Mr. Becking. Um, right now, everybody that attends fills out the waiver each time they attend, and they fill out the screening form each time they attend. Um, will this continue on for, um, do you know how long that will continue on for? Or is this something that will be changed with the new regulations? Um, Your Worship, with respect to the waiver, 
um, the uh, it's becoming increasingly impractical. Um, I have spoken to uh, legal counsel and they've advised that posting of the waiver on the front door um, will have about the same effect as as okay. a, an execution. So with respect to the to the waiver, uh, we will be taking an alternate but comparable approach. With respect to the screening, the screening must be active. So each individual through the door must specifically respond to each of the uh, of the potential symptoms and confirm for the person uh, who we've we've uh, tentatively uh, referred to as the greeter to uh, in addition to validating their name, um, their contact information in terms of a phone number or email, um, their vaccination status, their identity check, and uh, as well uh, their uh, the fact that they are not uh, uh, exhibiting any symptoms of, of the virus at the time of entry. Uh, may I have a supplementary? Um, for the, um, well, we, we have the walking club. So for every single person that comes in, we have verified, one person has verified that they all have had their two shots. Um, could the staff member come and verify that those people have had the shots? If, the sa if it's the same people that are coming week after week, do they have to verify every single week that they've had their shots? When, yes. when you've already verified it. Every, every session uh, has to be dealt as a standalone event. Okay, so there's no durations for repeating events. Okay, thank you. No. Oh, one other thought. Are council members considered staff members? No. <laughs> I tried. <laughs> I know where you're going. I, I had I had to stop and think about that one. So I'll I'll give you that one. That was a good shot, uh, Councillor. <laughs> good shot, Councillor. Thank Abbott. you, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Through you. Uh, okay, we've we've talked about the the Paul on the social settings. It does seem like it's uh, very restrictive, and it may be early. I want to talk for a minute about us doing business, how we do our business. Um, we as a township, how we interface with each other. Um, you know, there, there are so, so many questions that, that, that I have, you know, let, let us just suppose for a minute that we all get together as counselors and have an actual in-person council meeting. And, and we don't even know if each other are really truly vaccinated. So, you, you know, it's interesting when I, when I hear, and I hear a lot of discussion about when are people going back to work? When does the township office open up again, et cetera? Um, and I guess to, to staff, uh, to, uh, I guess to the CAO, perhaps, when are we going to have those discussions? Because I, I would think we should be having, you know, I'm hearing we can't, uh, we can't dance, we can't drink together, we shouldn't eat together, but th this is doing business together. And, and I wonder where we're six feet apart, we're at a mask, someone's across the desk, we've got our facility set up in Port Carling, I've seen it, it looks like it's um, pretty solid. If we follow that criteria, why are we not talking in terms of getting together and having physical in-person meetings, either in the office and or at, uh, at council? What does that runway look like? If we're not doing it this month, we're doing it in how many months? When are we going to talk about that? Because I, I can't imagine the rules are going to relax much more. They're, they're relaxed. So uh, I think if you're specifically talking to about council in-person meetings, uh, again, the report in front of us talks about uh, reopening of the office um, specifically and people, the doors opening as such, people can come in for general inquiries. So that's certainly sta stage one. Uh, I'll let CL Hammond talk about uh, medical officer's uh, comments and recommendations, if you will, from a council getting together or council in-person meetings and I'll turn to the CAO. Thanks, Your Worship. So with respect to council meetings, uh, the report does contemplate that as well. And so at this point, the Medical Officer of Health is recommending continuation of virtual meetings. Uh, should council wish to consider in-person meetings, uh, there are a couple scenarios laid out. Um, if we do have in-person meetings, we're planning on meeting uh, at the Port Carling Mem Memorial Community Center. And um, that likely, we would likely need to have hybrid meetings. So we're staff are continuing to pursue and understand the technological needs to allow that to happen. 
Um, my sense is at this point that we would, should council wish to get together and meet in the new year, um, we would ha have a hybrid setup whereby staff and council would be present in the chambers, but we likely would have uh, a Zoom link for the public to attend so they could have the convenience of attending from their own home and we would have a, a TV screen or some, something like that where council could see and hear those delegates. And as well, those members of council who may not be comfortable meeting in person for, for, for various reasons. Thank you. Councillor Zavis, does that answer your question? The report itself suggests that uh, early 2022, this would be reevaluated whether or not we want to uh, get together in person, but uh, we're gonna stay the course. Uh, the recommendation right now is through the end of this calendar year. Uh, see what changes. Uh, as uh, our CIO has commented that we're sort of in fourth wave, the province is rescinding its uh, prior recommendations and uh, see where we go. I mean, the reality is we are getting together uh, just virtually versus in person, uh, no doubt that we uh, may want to start more, but uh, my recommendation certainly is not uh, for next uh, month, uh, but maybe look at uh, January, maybe February cycle uh, with appropriate protocols. So did you have any other further okay, comment? I, I, yeah, thank you. And I, I certainly appreciate that, sir. I, uh, you're, you're coming back to me. I, yeah, I mean, I'm like everyone else. I, I want to be cautious, careful, safe, but I also think we need to get back to business. And and I th if that's what I'm hearing here, that we're going to be talking about this in a more fulsome manner, January 1, great, I'm all for that. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I just uh, want to make one comment so that the public are very clear. This council has never stopped doing business. Um, I, I'm actually amazed at the amount of work that has gone on uh, for the last 18 months. Uh, no question we did pause for 30 or 45 days where we missed one cycle uh, before we got into Zoom. But we have continued to meet. We've continued to manage special projects. We've continued to have special meetings. After special meetings, we've had small Zoom calls with certain councillors on it. So um, I don't think it's totally fair just uh, put a stake in the ground that we are not working and we have not got back to business. We're in a different type of business is all. Uh, I think uh, there, there is uh, definitely a positive at times for in-person interaction, and, uh, but we are still moving things forward as noted by the amount of items on our agendas. So, uh, Councillor Kelly. Uh, thank you and through you, and I couldn't, uh, I couldn't agree more. I think uh, uh, particularly staff have done a remarkable job of coping with everything that, that was uh, COVID. Um, my issue is less to do with getting back to business and more to do, and it's a common theme from the Bell Arena, with getting back to a sense of normal interpersonal relations, sitting across the table, uh, working together as a team. It is something we've been able to do on Zoom, but it's not nearly the same. Um, I think we have quite naturally and quite understandably by law had to kind of segregate ourselves and pan ourselves away uh, for a long time. And I'm one who believes we shouldn't uh, allow that to continue any longer than it absolutely necessary. So at the first opportunity, I think we need to be prudent and careful and follow the rules, obviously. Uh, but I do think we need to move back into uh, uh, life pre-COVID for the, for the mental health, particularly the, uh, the emotional health and the relationship health of uh, all the people that work in our organization and council as well. I, I had one quick question for either um, the CAO or uh, Director Becking. One of the obstacles I think that has existed in the, either the provincial mandate or in the um, um, medical officer for Simcoe uh, uh, Muskoka is this general notion that if, if you can, you should continue working remotely. And I wanna know if that still exists and if it's still, as uh, strong as worded perhaps as it was uh, a while ago. Uh, or or are they backing off from that? Because that kind of general, uh, that general oversight or general statement is a pretty hard one to break away from. Thank you. I know our CIO wants to chime in on that. Uh, through you, Your Worship, thanks for the question, Councillor Kelly. I can, uh, Mr. 
Becky can add to this, but my understanding uh, in the correspondence that I've seen and the meetings I've attended from uh, with the Medical Officer of Health uh, of the Simcoe Muskoka District Health Unit is uh, he's taking a very cautious approach and is recommending a continu continuation of alternate work uh, arrangements along with remote meetings for council. Um, and that's his, that's his recommendation. He's also putting it out there that uh, um, where in-person meetings, council meetings, uh, are contemplated certain requirements and certainly those will be taken into consideration um, should we hear from council that you agree and you want to move forward in the new year with uh, with potentially meeting thank you thank you councillor roberts thank you chair and through you and i'm i was sitting here trying to figure out how i'm going to frame this um in light of last week i was in mississauga and toronto um arenas and um, they would not accept paper um, acknowledgement of my vaccination. I required to have the, the QR code. And I and in both places, I was screened by, first in the first place in Mississauga by a security guard. And the second one in Toronto, I was, secure, uh, was secured by, or, or, or confirmed by, I guess staff, or it could be a, a minimum wage worker. But I know after I've said that, um, we can't get minimum wage workers anywhere in Muskoka. So we're really caught between a rock and a hard place. And so I guess getting to a question, how much do we have to increase our 2022 budget in order to accommodate two events per day in six um uh, six community centers and two arenas. I think it's something maybe you don't answer now, but I think on the 23rd, we're going to want to know what's the impact to the budget. Thank you. Thank you for that comment, Director Becking. I see nodding. Maybe we'll uh, have a comment back on the 23rd when we get to budget deliberations, because obviously uh, all of COVID and all the decisions we make uh, certainly have impacts to our bottom line. So anybody else any comments or questions? I, I was just going to to comment, Mr. Your, your Worship. Um, the um, uh, I'm comfortable that we're going to be able to see our way clear through this year, through this fiscal year, uh, within the existing budget envelope. Uh, we're trying to ascertain what will be the the annual impact for 2022, and we will bring that forward at at the 23rd uh, or as soon as we're able. To. Okay, thank you for that. Any other comments? I have a resolution moved by Councillor Kelly, seconded by Councillor Mazin. Be it resolved that Township Council approve the updated Township Muskoka Lakes Municipal Operations COVID-19 Reopening Framework attached as Appendix 2 to Report Number CIO 2021-02. Any further comments? I'll call the question. All those in favor? We are carried. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Uh, we're going to move on to um, award of contract uh, regarding our master fire plan. Um, Chief Morrell, did you want to introduce this briefly? Oh, another Movember going on. Welcome, Chief. Uh, thank you, uh, Your Worship, through you uh, to Council. Uh, what you have before you is a report that outlines uh, an agreement or sorry, outlines the award of contract and uh, the scoring matrix that we use to award the contract. Um, I think the report stands for itself. I'll stand for questions. Thank you very much. Council, any questions? Seeing none, I have a resolution moved by Councilor Bridgman, seconded by Councilor Edwards. <clears throat> oh, wrong. Just want to make sure 8C, 8C. My, moved by Councillor Nishikawa, seconded by Councillor Roberts. Be it resolved the RFP P 2021-32 provision of consulting services for the creation of a Township Muskoka Lakes Master Fire Plan be awarded to Emergency Management and Training Inc. in the amount not to exceed $68,372 plus applicable taxes, and that the consulting services agreement be prepared, and that final terms of said agreement be to the satisfaction of Fire Chief and the Township of Muskoka Lakes, Muskoka Lakes Solicitor, and further the Fire Chief be authorized to execute the necessary documents to proceed with the project. All those in favor? 
So that is carried. Thank you. Um, there we go. Uh, we've got some surplus lands, uh, surplus, surplus, surplus in the name of Arts, OSR, uh, Marcellus Road, and Hargrove, looks like. Any comments on those? I think, do we have them grouped into one resolution, I believe? If I can find them. It's original Shore Road. 9A1. Okay, I'll just make sure I've got the right resolution here. Um, my apologies, folks. Thank you, Troll. Bylaw. Is that it's 9A1? Okay, there we go. So I have a resolution moved by Councillor Jagowitz, second by Councillor Kelly, be it resolved that the following lands be declared as surplus. And that is a portion of original shore allowance, concession seven, lot 20 watt, part one on plan 35R, 20401, arts, roll 21031. Portion of original shore road allowance, concession two, lot four, Cardwell, part one, on plan 35R, 26541. And that's Marseille's, roll 12134. And a portion of original shore road allowance concession B lot 28 watt part one on plan 35R 26563 Broad, roll 229, a portion of original shore road allowance concession 13 lot 16 wood part one on plan 35R 26564 Hargrave, roll 8986. And that the clerk is hereby instructed to dispose of said property pursuant to section 8911 of the Municipal Act 2001 and further that road closure and conveyance bylaw 2021-169 arts, bylaw 2021-170 Marseilles, bylaw 2021-171 Broad and bylaw 2021-172 uh, Hargrove be read a first, second and third time and finally passed. All grouped together in one nice neat package. Any comments on those? I'll call the question. All those in favor? And that is carried. Thank you very much. Um, so that does a bunch of those. Land, land, land. Uh, okay. Looks like we are going to move to, we got 9A4. Item 9A4 here. No, oh, that's going to buy us. Uh, and that's uh, corporate seal agreement between Ministry of Infrastructure. Do we have a report on that or not? We do. I apologize, Council. Just a little bit out of order. Uh, and Director um, Donaldson, did you want to report on this quickly? Infrastructure, ICP. Thank you, yep. Thank you Your Worship. So the report uh, is asking for authorization to enter into a transfer payment agreement. It was an application we made last year to the Ministry of Infrastructure. It was a federal and provincial funding agreement to support uh, development of some of our trails. And that was approved by the minister earlier this year. And this is uh, just authorization to enter into that agreement for $100,000. And that amount was included in last year's capital budget. Okay. Any comments from council on the proposed? Resolution moved by Councillor Bridgman, seconded by Councillor Edwards. And Councillor Edwards is on the screen. Thank you. Be it resolved that bylaw 2021-178 to authorize the mayor and clerk to execute and affix a corporate seal to an agreement between with the Ministry of Infrastructure regarding, uh, I believe that's between the Township of Muskoka Lakes and the Ministry. That's just a typo here. Hang on. Uh, an agreement between the Township of Muskoka Lakes with the Ministry of Infrastructure regarding approved funding under the Investing in Canada Infrastructure Program COVID-19 resilience infrastructure stream, local government intake stream projects and support with Township Muskoka Lakes Trails Upgrade Program to read a first, second and third time and finally passed. All those in favor? That one's carried, thank you. Okay. 8J, Cash and Lou. Um, Okay, so last cycle, I think we talked about uh, potential of a deferral agreement. Is that correct? Um, IJ. Uh, Mr. Pink, I'm not sure if you want to answer this one. Uh, development services, cash in lieu of parking payment. IJ. 
Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I apologize. I was in the midst of uh, working very lengthy resolution, so I apologize if this uh, introduction is a little scattered. Um, but I'm sure, likely, committee councillors recall at the last planning committee meeting, we did have a cash and lieu parking application. Uh, there was direction from committee members to consult with the Economic Development and Grants Committee as to an appropriate relief uh, from the current $3,000 per parking space. Uh, Mr. Moore and myself did attend the Economic Development uh, and Grants Committee meeting. I believe it was in late October. Uh, and uh, they did uh, their recommendation, although uh, their minutes won't be ready until they meet again. Uh, but their recommendation was that uh, a deferral agreement uh, be entered into uh, that would defer payments of the $3,000 per parking space. Uh, with that said, they did not uh, outline any specific uh, time period. I believe the intent of the discussion was generally that once uh, the impacts of COVID uh, cease uh, impacting local businesses. Um, and uh, they did look to council to determine an appropriate timeline. Uh, the way the recommendation is written uh, is that uh, after, uh, I believe it's uh, January 2023, if any application for cash in lieu of parking is received up until that date, a deferral agreement would be entered into where that applicant would not have to pay for parking for two years. So if they applied in uh, December 2022, uh, they would not have to pay for another two years. If they applied in March 2023, they would have to pay uh, immediately. Um, the other option is to simply um, put a date as to when you feel payments uh, should be uh, collected by uh, municipal staff. Um, so that is the direction from the Economic Development and Grants Committee as outlined in the report. Uh, happy to answer any questions. Thank you for that. Council, any questions on this? Councilor Nishikawa and then Councilor Jagowitz. Thank you. Um, I'm not quite sure. I think we're, are we just being asked to give you a date? Um, and if so, I would recommend that it would be at uh, December of 2023. I don't know that that's against the policy that we just heard read, but um, that would be my recommendation if that's what we're being asked to put a recommendation in. Uh, Mr. Pink, we're, I think the recommendation is a two-year deferral, correct? That's correct. There's uh, two aspects. One, I guess there are other options as outlined in the report to the Economic Development and Grants Committee um, that you could simply uh, reduce the fees or waive the fees, but the recommendation was to defer. I believe that's the first um, portion that you would uh, need to consider. And then the second aspect is the date, and that's correct. The current recommendation is a two-year deferral. So if anybody has any differing opinions on the two-year deferral, uh, I think we would hear it at this particular point. I'm not seeing any. Councillor Jagowitz, you had a question or a comment? I did have a question, yes. A hypothetical to the director. Um, so I assume a, a cash in lieu is associated with an application for some type of approval. So I assume they sign the deferred agreement, get their uh, application approved, they do whatever they're applying for, and after the two years, what happens if it remains unpaid? Is the approval then undone or uh, what happens? They just... Mr. Pink. Yeah. Thank you, uh, through your worship. Uh, that is a good question that's noted in, in staff support that uh, collection or enforcement may be uh, the issue there, but at that point they would be offside of their agreement and it would become an enforcement issue of staff to either collect the fees or have the patio removed. So we have a future a couple of options going forward if they decided not to pay. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Hayes. Thank you, through you. Um, being that we're doing this for the one patio, um, is this something that we're looking to do for other restaurants or are other businesses going to come forward? Is the two-year deferral? I'm, I'm just a little bit leery that everybody is going to all of the developments that have parking in lieu will ask for a two-year deferral which will really put a pause on some of our parking issues um can we make it specific to patio units or restaurants or 
is it just parking in lieu? If you apply, you have a two-year deferral. Mr. Fink. Thank you. Uh, the way it is currently worded, uh, those are all good questions that were discussed uh, by the committee. They would apply for uh, all uses, would not just be restaurants. Uh, yes, this did emanate or spurred by a particular application from a restaurant in Bala, but the recommendation is across the board. So any future application uh, that would come in uh, would, uh, if approved, uh, would be entitled to defer payments for two years. Um, I would note it's, it's not a very common uh, application. Um, we may get uh, one or two every uh, year or two, uh, but it's not a common application. And uh, it can certainly be reevaluated at any time. If council directs that the temporary patio extension program cease or the deferral agreement cease, uh, you can revisit that uh, at any time if it's a, a concern. But I think the intention of the committee, and I look to the, the chair of that committee, um, was that as long as local restaurants and businesses are experiencing impacts from COVID, uh, that they could defer payments to expand uh, their patios uh, and for two years. Uh, and then with the hope, obviously, that at that time, uh, we're back to normal. Uh, thank you. I'm not sure. If A supplementary? Right. Supplementary. Um, what, what would happen if during that two-year period, um, that business up and left? Mr. Pink, um, the I guess uh, thinking it through, the uh, I guess they may have got away with not having to pay for that temporary time period. But obviously, if they up and left, the patio would be gone. There would no longer be a parking deficiency, um, and uh, they would not uh, benefit from it uh, any further. Uh, albeit, they wouldn't have paid for that period of time. Just uh, for council's uh, edification, if you remember in this particular case, um, we're not charging anybody for a patio extension under COVID because we move them outside. Uh, in this particular case, they want to legalize this and make it a permanent patio extension, which has triggered the cash in lieu of parking. So, and as Mr. Pink says, it's not that often that we undergo this cash in lieu of parking scenario. Uh, the only thing I would recommend is that uh, in the minutes, we make sure that this, uh, if we are amending the bylaw to allow a two year extension, that we actually revisit this bylaw and the amendment to this bylaw a year from now and it doesn't get left in perpetuity and we find this four years from now that we haven't uh, readdressed it. So I think we can probably deal with that in a minute to staff. Um, Councillor Roberts. Uh, yes, I don't have a problem with, with uh, patio extensions or anything else like that, but commercial ventures that are uh, making a uh, profit, uh, I don't think we should be actually uh, deferring the payments and that they're uh, getting uh, the, uh, something and they, they uh, can't provide the parking, they should be paying it upfront. And that it, it's different with it's a, it's a restaurant that wants a patio or, or something else like that. But a uh, commercial uh, venture that's gonna be making profit on it, uh, I think that they should be being up front, just my view, thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Mr. Pink, let me just uh, make a recommendation here or a question. Um, and I, sitting in on the economic development discussion surrounding this, would it be appropriate to amend this resolution as a friendly amendment to uh, execute a cash and parking deferral agreement with a two year here uh, expiry period uh, for those, and just put a quality for those uh, businesses impacted by COVID. And just to encapsulate, if it's a new business coming in and wants to do a powder extension, but I think it's just purely we're dealing with those businesses that have been affected over the last uh, two years and who want to cash in lieu of parking or want to expand, that might just help us. David? Um, certainly that could be considered. I think you may want to think about uh, what you mean by impacted by COVID. That's a quite a subjective uh, statement and might result in some interesting discussions in front of council. What you could consider is uh, as impacted by COVID as determined by council and you leave it on a case by case basis if you're willing to take sort of those chances. Um, what I would suggest uh, further to my comments on the time limit, again, the committee did not uh, stipulate how long they felt this deferral should be in place. I would recommend an amendment to the resolution to at the very end state until, and then that would resolve your concern that you previously mentioned of someone remembering a year or two from now to uh, revoke or rescind 
this resolution. So I would look for a direction from council as to uh, when you suggest. I think the staff report suggests that uh, if we look at the province's uh, anticipated guidelines of, of res lifting restrictions approximately March uh, 2022, um, I think the suggestion was maybe perhaps a year after that date, uh, the relief could be could be lifted. So perhaps I believe the report suggests uh, January 2023. Um, so I would suggest adding the time limit. Uh, in my mind, uh, again, I think uh, further to Councillor Edwards' comments, I think all the businesses are in the business of trying to make money. Um, and I wouldn't particularly, um, you know, I don't think Council would like to have a discussion on whether uh, the business is impacted by COVID or not, and how much so, uh, debating the fees. Um, you might uh, wish not to go down that slippery slope, but I leave it in your hands. Thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Edwards and then Councillor Kelly. I think I have some amendment wording. Uh, actually, could it not be done by a case by case and, and that business uh, and that because each one that, that comes in, I uh, have to ask for uh, in that parking. Uh, in, in lieu of so we can do it case by case rather than putting a blanket out there because each one is is different if it's a new venture somebody building something uh for rent or lease or that uh you know it, it might be different than a, a business asking for something temporary so i would leave it case by case thank you thank you i think we've got that captured councillor kelly uh, thank you. And through you, <clears throat> the goal here really was for the township to uh, make a meaningful gesture to support the development and the growth of business in the township, both existing businesses and new businesses. We chose not to pursue a waiver of, uh, of the fee or reduction of the fee. It's simply a deferral. Um, if there's a weakness in the whole in the whole arrangement, I will agree uh, with uh, Councillor Hayes who raised a good question, what happens if they pack up and leave in the middle of the night? And the reality is if they pack up and leave in the middle of the night, we're not gonna get the money back. Uh, the cost of pursuit and the cost of collection likely will outweigh the cost or the, the value of, the, of anything we can receive. So we're, we're, trying, to, we're trying to minimize the risk uh, and the cost, but I really don't think we should be the arbiters of who was affected and, and whether you're making money uh, a lot of businesses are in, all businesses hopefully are in the business of making money, whether or not they're, they're actually making any coin is a whole other issue that I don't think we want to delve into. Um, I'm happy leaving it across the boards to all uh, parking in, or payment in lieu uh, across all different types of business, whether they're new arrivals or existing businesses. It's simply a two-year deferral on the payment. Thank you. Uh, appreciate those comments and uh, I'll look to council if we wanted to provide a recommendation. Um, the amendment prior to Councillor Kelly speaking would be to add uh, as impacted by COVID as recommended by council, which they would be coming to us. Um, I, personally, if a new business was coming into town and wanted to take over the parking lot and create a new patio, I'm not sure I'm gonna be recommending an automatic deferral of uh, cash in lieu of parking, um, especially we don't have a history with them. This is impacted and we can judge an impact. We know this restaurant has an impact. Um, and I think the other would be, and the uh, deferral program expire on January, 2023 or in January, 2023 would get us to that finish line. Mr. Pink, does that uh, satisfy your comments to put an end date? Okay. So council, the question I ask is, do we want to limit this or allow council to chime in on every application or do we want to make it a blanket for whoever wants cash and loot? Anybody want to comment right now? I, I personally would be limiting it uh, and letting council chime in because we have to chime in anyway. Councillor Bridgman, then Councillor Edwards. Um, so thank you, Mayor Harding. But I thought the reason we were putting this in place is because it takes a long time to get liquor licenses and Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So we were going to streamline it and let staff basically take care of it. I is my memory. I don't think my memory's fading on that part. I thought that was part of the rationale. Well, so if I may, Councillor Bridgman, if I'm not mistaken, we're actually blending two programs. Um, in this particular case, uh, we're automatically again downloading to staff the temporary patio extension. 
but the deferral of cash in lieu, we don't charge cash in lieu for a temporary patio extension. In this particular case, there's a business in Bala that wants a permanent exemption, which would trigger cash in lieu. And that's all we're trying to deal with in the permanent exemption. We're deferring payment for two years. Uh, thank you. I plead 4.30 in the afternoon for not picking up on that. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Edwards. Uh, yes, I, I would still say case by case because say somebody uh, comes in, they're doing a large uh, development for rental or something like that. They're, they're, they're getting a break on the parking. They should be paying it up front. So I would go still go case by case. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hayes. Case by case, please. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to go to Councillor Zavitz first and then Councillor Kelly, even though Councillor Z Z Kelly unmuted himself. Councillor Zavitz. <laughs> uh, thank you. It's for you. Um, what, what I, well, again, I want to spin this back to the beginning. It, to my mind, it was really a food service type of thing, a patio. This was all about patios. And um, while it is about what it started, I suppose, about one patio in one place, there were more than one patio. There is more than one patio. And, and as these guys expand and, and suffer the wrath of COVID and as they have, that's where we started. So I, I, get, I think it's getting a little convoluted with the whole notion of this business, that business and, and cash and lieu. Uh, I would definitely say we should stick to the two years. I mean, that was the spirit of the, of the ActDev committee. That, so I'm, I'm hearing um, 2023, January, this is essentially, we're almost at January 22. So that's really a year and two months, not two years. So I, I think we should clarify a little bit of this language. So maybe I've just confused you even more, but I would think if we were gonna reduce it to any one industry, it certainly would be the food service industry. Okay, so if I can try and summarize where we're at with the proposed amendments. So right now we would be voting on putting in place a cash in lieu, in pro, uh, cash in lieu of parking uh, program, deferral payment program. That program would go in place that would allow for a two-year deferral, but the program would only be in place between now and January 2023. We could extend it at that particular point. It's not a 12-month deferral. It's still a two-year deferral, but we're putting an end date on this program. The second part of the proposed amendment is so that we don't have somebody, in the words of Councillor Jaggett's, drive a truck through our front door and ask for all the parking spaces is that as a case by case basis, this would come before council and we don't have that many. I would be hard pressed for you to identify the last time we actually issued a cash in lieu of parking. So as opposed to just leaving it open to Pandora's box, uh, we would have it come before council and we can pick and choose uh, those who would be affected by COVID, which I think is the intent of the original. Councillor Kelly, do you have another comment? But otherwise I'm gonna read this resolution. Only comment, uh, thank you and through you. The only comment I have is, uh, if we're going to do it on a case by case basis, I don't understand what we would need to see from every applicant in order to make a real and fair decision. Uh, financial statements, uh, uh, these are private companies, mostly startups, mostly financial statements on the back of an envelope. I, I just can't understand how we're going to be that discreet. That's all. Okay. So I appreciate that. And again, I'm going to come back to the purpose of this is we had an existing business within the township who wanted to legalize a patio and has asked for an exemption. We didn't have an exemption or a reason. We put a program in place based on COVID related. And uh, we're answering that COVID pro pro problem with this deferral program with some parameters. So that's not just wide open to anybody new coming into the business uh, and that council can chime in on it as opposed to staff just automatically granting a deferral. Councillor Zavis, do you have a specific question? Otherwise I wanna read this resolution. I, I do and thank you for this opportunity. Uh, my only question is very specifically to David. I mean, is this the only uh, cash in lieu um, request you have on your desk right now? And if it is, I'm, I'm not sure about <laughs> the confidentiality piece, but I'm aware of another one. And maybe I'm wrong, but um, there's Green. another food service. I believe this is our only current uh, complete uh, cash and parking application uh, before committee at this time. There may be others imminently coming in, but I'm not aware of any. Um, don't know if Mr. Sharp uh, is aware of any. Okay, thank you. Okay, Council, I'm going to read this resolution moved by Councillor Evers, seconded by Councillor Hayes. Be it resolved that where a cash in lieu of parking approval is granted by Council, 
staff are authorized to execute a cash in lieu of parking payment deferral agreement with a two year expiry period as impacted by COVID as recommended by council and the deferral program expire on January 1st, 2023. Councillor Jaglitz has a question. And there's a second after the resolution. Yeah, it just struck me in the last comment that there was a matter in front of us not a few months ago where and it's uh, it's not a it's not a food service. It's like a, an office type building where there's going to be cash in lieu. So is this retroactive, um, or is it just start from today forward? Or I don't know where that application is. I think it's uh, it may not Mr. even Pink. be filed for it. So, Mr. Pink, uh, the uh, resolution, as I certainly read it, would be going forward. It would not be retroactive. I think if it's the development uh, I believe you're referring to, uh, that was actually an approval granted many, many years ago, just has yet to be fulfilled um, because it hasn't been fully developed yet. Uh, and again, my, um, I certainly wouldn't take uh, prior approvals from benefiting from resolution. It's dated as of today uh, and staff would implement it going forward. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, council, there is a second portion to this that I neglected to read that the cash and loop program would expire on January 1st, 2023, and that staff be directed to continue the current township temporary patio program until the end of the year 2022, which would also put this in lockstep. I'll call the question. All those in favor? And that is carried. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm going to suggest we take a quick seven minute break and then we're going to come back and try and work our way through the rest of the day. Thank you.
Okay, we'll try and get council back. Okay, council, I think we've got uh, everybody back or get your camera turned on probably to make sure we're official. Uh, we're gonna move, just jump around a couple of little bit things. First of all is to restore some parking restrictions uh, in the Morris area. Um, I'm gonna go right ahead and read this resolution. It's moved by Councilor Roberts and seconded by Councilor Zavitz, be it resolved that bylaw 2021-179 to amend bylaw 2022-053 to restore the parking restrictions previously in place under the former parking bylaw and consistent with the signage that is currently in place be read a first, second, and third time and finally passed. Councilor Zavitz has a question. Thank you and through you. Uh, if I don't support this, uh, my, my name's on the motion. Is that a problem? You're just, you're just putting it on the floor, that's all. Right. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, anybody else have any specific comments on this? Director Becking, I see your camera's on, but this is basically to correct uh, the inaccuracies in our prior bylaw, correct? That is correct, Your Worship. Okay, thank you. Okay, seeing no further questions, I'll call the question. All those in favor? And for the record, those from Ward A opposed. There he is. Thank you very much. Oh, and Ward B too. We see that. Okay, that is carried, Madam Clerk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Director Becking, for that. Uh, I have one more, just a bit of housekeeping. Moved by Councilor Roberts, seconded by Councilor Zavitz. Be it resolved that 2021-185, being a bylaw to appoint a building inspector for the enforcement of the Building Code Act and the building bylaw for the Township Muskoka Lakes be read a first, second, and third time and finally passed. Need a new building inspector. All those in favor? That one is done, carried. Thank you very much, appreciate that. Um, okay, Mr. Pink, I'm not sure if you're still working on our OPA 56 and some amendments. Uh, if you are, that's fine. We're gonna move on and go through some of our zoning bylaw amendments quickly. Um, and our first one is b, &B sanitation, is that correct? I seem to be out of order here for some reason. Now, B&B Sanitation, um, and uh, who would like to introduce this? Bailen, over to you, Ms. Darling. Thank you, Your Worship. In October, Planning Committee heard concurrent consent and zoning amendment application in the name of B&B Sanitation Services and Sander Redmond that were submitted for severed lot one to sever lands and add to a nearby lot. No new buildings or structures are proposed at this time. The second consent application was to sever a portion of the property, severed lot number two, to sever a portion of the property and add it to an abutting lot. No new lots or structure, no new buildings or structures are proposed at this time. The zoning bylaw amendment application was submitted to define and recognize severed lot number one and benefiting lot number one in consent application B8221 ML as one lot for planning purposes. Planning committee, re planning committee recommended to council that the application be approved. 
No concerns were raised by the Township's Development Service Division, Public Works Department, or the Community and Planning Services Department in the District Municipality of Muskoka. Four letters of support were submitted by members of the public prior to the Planning Committee. No minor amendments are required. I have no further comments at this time, but would be happy to assist with any questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. I'm gonna do first and second reading, moved by Councillor Hayes, seconded by Councillor Jagowitz. Be it resolved that bylaw 2021-85 to amend comprehensive zoning bylaw 2014-14, B&B Sanitation and Xander Redmond, rolls 83110 and 83119. Be read a first and second time. Council, all those in favor? My screen is slightly frozen. Yeah. Everybody's here, so let's just see here. We're gonna wait for it to come back. It's usually been coming back momentarily. We'll see whether the public can hear us at this point. It appears not. Does the temperature drop that much outside? Oh, I, I, can hear, I can hear you loud and clear. There we go. I think we're all back now. I can hear Councillor. Oh, I didn't see the vote. I heard Councillor Jagowitz briefly, but we did not see the vote here. So um, we're gonna to have to wait till we unfreeze the Zoom screen and can see a vote. And unfortunately, we're all still frozen. Councilor Jagowitz seems to be the only one who is unfrozen. No, oh, I think every everybody's- uh, Actually, it's just you, Phil. Yeah. And, and you're not that... frozen. <laughs> it's it's people, unfortunately, in the council chamber. You're, you're, Maybe I can do a, a verbal vote in favor. Can I go through Councilor Zavitz? Vote, Councillor Zavitz. Okay, and Councillor Bridgman, while you're open, but maybe well, while I'm open, I I'm in favor of this. Okay, Councillor Bridgman's in favor. Yeah, I'm in favor. Yes, Councillor Hayes is in favor. Okay, Councillor Chicago is in favor. I need Councillor Kelly. Roberts is in favor. Roberts, Councillor Kelly, and Zavitz. Kelly, yes. Jaglow, it's favor. Glenn, they can't see your hand. That's the issue. They're frozen. Okay. Glenn, unmute and speak. I will say yes. Councillor Edwards says yes. Okay. Yes. There we go. Can you hear me? Carried in that particular case. Yes. So thank you. Um, can you hear so me now? Uh, we can hear you now. We've still got a bit of <laughs> issue with some freezing going on. Um, there are no minor amendments to this. So people are kind of coming back and forth. I don't know what's going on with their bandwidth right now. Maybe we're uploading something at quarter to five that's taking our bandwidth. But uh, third and final reading, moved by Councillor Kelly, second by Councillor uh, Mazin, be it resolved that bylaw 2021-85, B&B Sanitation Services, Xander Redmond be read a third time and finally passed. It appears that we may have some screen. Can I get everyone to hold their hands up in favor? And that one is carried. We got that one through. So thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, next is uh, Hodge and Palmer. Who's going to be introducing this one? Mr. Soya. Uh, good afternoon, Your Worship and members of council. Um, in October, planning committee heard a zoning bylaw amendment application in the name of Hodge and Palmer and recommended that bylaw 2021-098 be approved, subject to a minor amendment to rezone wetland areas to environmental protection. Uh, this subject property is located at 1047 Neil Bethune Road. It's at 46 acres in size and is vacant, except for a couple of storage containers and trailers. Uh, the zoning bylaw amendment is um, has been submitted to rezone uh, the property, which is currently open space and environmental protection, and uh, to rezone it to um, the open space portion to rural to facilitate the construction of a dwelling and attached garage, as well as a separate detached garage. Uh, given that two wetlands currently are not protected through zoning, the minor amendment has been recommended to rezone these wetlands from open space to environmental protection. Uh, on today's um, Agenda as well is a site plan control bylaw to designate these lands um, uh, as as being subject to the site plan control process. If um, council is uh, um, would like, I could uh, cover that currently as well. Uh, 
Okay, you're recommending site plan control. Thank you. Well, yeah. So there, so there was a little bit of, um, uh, I guess, further um, a discussion to be to be had on that matter. Um, in so um, the planning committee expressed concerns with the proximity of the subject lands to a neighboring property that is owned by Brent Quarries and is licensed for aggregate extraction. Mr. Brent had submitted a letter stating that the proposed residential development could potentially result in a compatibility concern. In this case, available mapping shows that the area that is licensed for extraction is located over 2,000 feet uh, or 600 meters from the closest lot line of this uh, 46 acre property and uh, over 3,000 feet or one kilometer from the location where residential development is now proposed on the property. Uh, given these distances, staff have not directly flagged this proposal as creating a compatibility concern uh, in this case. Um, however, as a consensus was not reached at planning committee on how to potentially notify future landowners of the aggregate operation uh, committee, um, asked staff to provide options to council today. Um, if council would like uh, notice of the aggregate operation to be registered on title, it appears that the only option under the Planning Act uh, would be to designate this property in the proposed development to be subject to site plan control. Uh, a site plan agreement could then be required prior to development in which the owners acknowledge their proximity to an active aggregate operation and this agreement would be registered on title for future property owners to see. Another more light-handed approach uh, would be, um, and in consideration of the distances involved here, would be to simply note in the minutes that the applicant has been made aware of the property's proximity to an aggregate property. Uh, this would leave it up to future property owners to complete their own diligence at the time of purchase. Uh, in the event that council would like to see a site plan agreement be registered on title, staff have prepared the site plan control bylaw that is on today's agenda to, de to designate the subject property to this process. Um, and so there's a uh, committee did leave um, that part of this up to uh, council to, uh, to decide if site plan control would be appropriate in this case, but uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions about the proposal or about um, this matter or the minor amendment. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Councillor Nishikawa, then Councillor Bridgman. I think because of the size of the property and um, activities on the neighboring property, I don't believe that a site plan control is needed at this point. It'll get, uh, it, it'll be very challenging. I'm, I'm just thinking about my own property, for instance, and um, lots of acreage and lots of every little thing then would require a permit, not a permit, but a change to the site plan. So that, that very concerns me if he happens to put up a shed, if he happens, you know, it, I, I think that this is very onerous uh, and doesn't really serve a great purpose for, to the municipality at this point. Thank you for that, Councillor Bridgman. But just quickly, thank you, Mayor Harding. I don't see uh, putting this onto the current owner. Uh, when somebody buys a property, it's their responsibility to figure out what's around it. And I, I just, uh, I think that's where it gets left. So I wouldn't support a site plan on this. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Hayes. I'm going to agree with Councillor Nishikawa and Councillor Bridgman. I believe that um, Mr. Soya's light-handed approach of just um, having a letter is good enough for me. I don't believe a site plan is warranted. Thank you for that. I'm going to read first and second, moved by Councillor Zavitz, second by Councillor Bridgman. Be it resolved that bylaw 2021-98 to amend comprehensive zoning bylaw 2014-14 Hodge and Palmer, roll 226-007. Be read a first and second time. All those in favor? Oh, I, I'm seeing things. So all those in favor, we'll see if we can hold our hands up for a moment. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, the only person I do not see is Councillor Mazan. I see everybody, I see everyone's hands up. Madam Clerk, my screen? Yes, okay. We have confirmed that. We are carried, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Sawyer, from a minor amendment perspective, the only minor amendment would have been that subject to site plan control. That's correct. And in this particular case, I think we're getting a sense we don't need site plan control, correct? 
So you're good for third reading. Thank you. Moved by Councillor Jagowitz, seconded by Councillor Kelly, be it resolved that bylaw 20, 2198, Hodge and Palmer be read a third time and finally passed. Council, all those in favor? I see that carried and I see Mr. Sharp wants to add the question. Bryce, or are you voting in favor? Sorry, uh, Councillor, or Councillor Hardy, or Mayor Harding, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, I got caught off guard here. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to flag you down because uh, my video won't turn on. Um, but I just wanted to make sure uh, that the minor amendment to rezone the wetlands was included in that. It may be too late, but um, I believe uh, Mr. Soya had identified a need uh, to um, do a minor amendment for uh, a rezoning of the wetland areas to EP1. Uh, okay, thank you. Sorry, we missed that. Uh, Madam Clerk, how do we want to deal with this that we're still... I do have a minor amendment. Um, yes. Okay. Um, am I okay, even though we've read third and final passage? Are you okay if we institute a minor amendment prior and blame it on Zooming? I don't think we can. Okay, so we're gonna have to pass an additional bylaw. Um, does that, can that be a minor amendment bylaw? Or can we pass immediately with two thirds consent, a bylaw to amend bylaw 2021-98 to include the rezoning? I think we're gonna have to take it over. That's a possibility. We're gonna pause on that and we might be able to do that one later. Um, Okay, thank you. I'm going to go move on to Mirsky. Um, any comments from uh, Ms. Walker? Thank you, Your Worship and members of Council. A zoning bylaw amendment application has been submitted in the name of Mirsky to permit two dwelling units on one lot and permit a proposed dwelling to have a height of 43 feet. In October, Planning Committee recommended to Council that the exemption permitting two dwelling units on one lot be approved and that the exemption for a dwelling height be denied. I would, it was also recommended that the subject property and proposed development be made subject to site plan control. Therefore, a minor amendment is required to remove the height exemption from the bylaw. Um, several letters of support were received from neighbors. The district of Muskoka did express concerns about conformity with the Muskoka official plan and the townships building department and public works department both indicated they had no objections to the application. I have no further comments, but we'd be happy to assist council with any questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Council, any questions on this particular? I'll read first and second, moved by Councillor Mazin, seconded by Councillor Nishikawa. Be it resolved that bylaw 2021-155 to amend comprehensive zoning bylaw 2014-14, Mirsky, roll 2857, be read at first and second time. All those in favor? Councillor Nishikawa, you have a question or are you voting in favor? Sorry, it, it was a question. I, I wanted to have a clearer understanding of whether we captured um, what was being brought forward to us for the height, for instance, like that we are not approving the height and things. Did we capture that? We will be capturing that in a minor amendment that we will not forget to read this time. Thank you. Okay, so on first and second reading, again, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Madam Clerk for Kerry, thank you. The minor amendment moved by Councillor Roberts, seconded by Councillor Zavitz, be it resolved the Township Council amend by law 2021-155 Mirsky. And this amendment is minor in nature and does not require further public circulation as hereby approved prior to third reading. The minor amendment shall consist of the removal of the exemptions related to height increase. So we are not approving the height increase. Any further comments on the minor amendment? All those in favor? Ms. Carey, thank you. Let me give you this as an option potentially. Thank you. Uh, and our third and final reading moved by Councillor Bridgman, seconded by Councillor Everts, be it resolved that bylaw 2021 155 Mirsky be read a third time and finally pass. Councillor Jaglitz has a question. Do you have to say something about a site plan? Uh, we're going to designate site plan in a separate bylaw okay. recommendation. So 
So not in the minor amendment, okay. No. So any further comments on third reading? All those in favor? That is carried, thank you. Okay, we're just, uh, okay. Okay, not a problem. Uh, so we do have uh, a bylaw to uh, impose site plan. Um, and it would be on Bogart, Mursky. We are not going to do it on Hodge Palmer, but also on Lang Mursky. Why do I have Lang Mursky on two of these? Island Jackson. Um, 184. We just passed two bylaws. Let me just pause for one moment here. I want to make sure we've got the right. Mr. Sharp, maybe you can answer the question without your camera. Uh, thank you, Mayor Harding. Uh, I can confirm that uh, those two bylaws for site plan control are related to separate properties. One is for uh, the Mersky application that you just dealt with on Lake Joseph, and the other is for um, uh, the Lang and Mersky uh, property on Lake Rosso. Okay. Thank you very much. Count, uh, moved by Councillor Mazan, seconded by Councillor Nishikawa, be it resolved that the following bylaws be read a first, second, and third time and finally passed. That's bylaw 2021-175 to designate site plan control parts of lot 21 and 22, concession B, Watt, Bogart, rule 2, 1356, and 2, 1357. Bylaw 2021-176 to designate site plan control, concession 5, Island Jackson, Lake Rosso, Watt, Mursky, 2, 8, 57. Uh, and as well as bylaw 2021-184, to designate site plan control as part of lot 35, concession 12, lot one, plan 32, Medora, Lang, Mursky, roll four, 1701. And just a quick question, is that plan 32 or is it not usually plan 35? For some reason I've got in my mind plan 35, just wanna confirm that, that it should be plan 32. Just just flagging as odd to me as I read these words. Mr. Sharp, maybe you can help. And that's the Lang Mursky application. Just wanna make sure it's not a typo. Nope. Mr. Sharp. Uh, thank you, Mayor Harding. I would say uh, if it is a, a minor typo, it's something that we can fix after the fact here. It's not uh, something that we need to be concerned with at this at this time. Okay. Madam Clerk, you okay with that? Should it be a minor typo as far as the plan? I don't like that as a minor typo. Okay, we don't like that as a different, as a minor typo. Maybe we can just, Mr. Sharp, pull <laughs> that, that Lang Mursky application and just confirm the exact plan. And I apologize, it just... Uh, to my recollection, most is plan 35. Will do. I'll do but that right now. Cool. Thanks. Thank you. I'll just pause for a brief moment. Mayor Harding? Yes, Councillor Mazan. I am now on my phone and I Not don't have access to my video. So I'm currently, I, and I noted that you, you had me on the resolution. So yeah. I don't know if that means anything. I will put myself on mute, but I am still here. I understand that we agree that you're still in the meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Just doing one quick check to make sure it's not a typo. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor Harding. I have confirmed and the, uh, the legal description as it's written in the bylaw is correct. Plan 32. Thank you very much. And I apologize for the delay. Uh, on site plan for these three properties, all those in favor? And that is carried. Thank you very much. Okay, let's come circle back to our OPA 56. Um, Mr. Pink has made some amendments that we discussed prior. And uh, I'm gonna read them slowly to everybody so we understand what we are contemplating. 
This, it would be a resolution moved by Councillor Kelly, seconded by Councillor Roberts, be it resolved that resolution SPLN 125021 be enacted with the following additional revisions made to OPA 56. Number one, the policy C1624I be amended to add equivalent unit after maximum, after the word maximum, excuse me. And that is related to the existing unit sizes at um, Legacy, as well as at the Red Leaf Lands or the JW Marriott. The second a minor amendment would be, or additional comments, that the definition of a unit in section C1.8 be amended to add, and C16.2.4 after C1436. Number three, and that the de definition of unit owners in section C18 be amended to add immediate family and after the word small uh, shall, excuse me, include there and before guests. Number four, that policy C1618 and C2628 be amended to add generally after the word identified and that in accordance with be replaced with including. Number five, that the second sentence of policy C1624B be deleted. Number six, that policy C1614H, C1624H, and C1636 uh, be amended to move the, cent, uh, the terms with the Minette Resort Village from the end of the sentence to after the words will be required. Number seven, the policy C1535 be amended to add to the satisfaction of after the words shall be required and the word by deleted. And number eight, the policy C1423 be amended to replace or with and. Number nine, the policy C1545 be amended to add any portion of after the word including that is two or less stories in height after the word wellness center. Number 10, the policy C1445 be amended to add encouraged to be prior to the word enhanced. And finally, number 11, policy C175D be amended to add while not mandated after the word shoreline. That would be a reflection of all of the changes uh, that uh, we heard from council today. Again, we will see this typed out, but it will be forwarded to the district, at which point our district councilors and the public will also have comments at that particular time. So our touching on this is not done. Any further comments or questions at this point? I'll call the question. All those in favor? And anyone opposed? That is carried. Mr. Pink, uh, congratulations on moving this forward. I know there's lots of technical uh, issues along the way here. We will see obviously a final draft of that. Maybe you can circulate the amended version uh, just so that council does have a copy of that. Um, but uh, to all those, to all the delegates we've heard today, uh, to our staff, to all of council for the past uh, several years of work on this, uh, also to our steering committee who uh, met for countless months, uh, who are probably still listening. Thank you all. Um, this, uh, if this amendment does finally come to fruition, uh, though it may not be what we all want, but it is a significant change to what the existing policies are within the village of Minette and certainly far greater protection for uh, the Township of Muskoka Lakes. Councilor Nishikawa. Thank you. I just was wondering, um, I, I have a sense, but I, I wanted to know your thoughts on when this would come to committee. So for, for example, in generally we would have a lighter December or like our council meetings are, are a little bit lighter uh, at, at district council. Um, so I just want, I don't want people to think that this is gonna happen in a month from now. 
Uh, so I just wanted your your comments maybe, on that. Maybe, Mr. Pink, you could advise what uh, you would anticipate. Uh, I know that uh, obviously district has been paying close attention to this, um, but maybe Mr. Pink can comment as to when we would expect this coming back to district. There he is. Um, thank you, uh, through your the worship. Um, I could certainly, uh, making those changes and circulating a copy to all council should not take uh, too long. I can circulate that uh, for your information. Uh, compiling the record uh, may take a little while. Uh, we have to uh, formally compile all the uh, information and forward it, probably looking at a month or so for that. And I can't speak for the district as to exactly how their long timeline, how their timelines would be. Uh, but I think further to uh, Councillor Nishikawa's questions, I don't think uh, this is going to happen anytime uh, very soon. It's probably going to be uh, quarter one or two next year. So, okay. thank you for that, Councillor Jagowitz. Yeah, uh, thank you, Chair. So that's that's what I would like to address. But before I do that, I'd like to say uh, I'm pleased this is moving forward. I hope this project turns out to be good. Because it's going to take so long, I think it's, uh, and I'm also concerned that Councillor Kelly did not vote for it. I was half and half. Um, Director Pink, you've indicated that you will make the changes and forward it to Council. I think it would be appropriate if one or two of us thought that it wasn't as agreed, that we could at least email you with our comments and those could get forwarded on to the district package. I'm not talking about uh, amending it any further. But those comments would come out when we're fresh in our mind rather than three months from now. So that would be my request. Thank you. Uh, okay, I appreciate those comments. Unfortunately, for any comments to go to the district, it would have to be that of all of council if council was to chime in on it. As a district councillor, you would be able to comment uh, at a district level. Um, but council has put this forward. If Mr. Pink uh, believed that there was something that was not reflected appropriately, um, then that would be a discussion uh, as he crafts the final, but um, I'm pretty confident that's the reason Mr. Pink took probably an hour to write the amendment that his uh, verbiage would be appropriate. Again, when we see the draft, finally, council can chime in if we want to make recommendations to that, Councillor Jagwitz, and I'd encourage you to bring that back to a planning committee meeting if there's something that wasn't reflected appropriately. But with all due respect, I, I tried to follow what he read. I couldn't make any sense of it other than one or two I understood. So, so as long as uh, we can make our comments somewhere, and I'm interested in Councillor Kelly's comments also. Thank you. Absolutely, we we will obviously have an opportunity again if there's something that wasn't caught or reflected, uh, that can come back to this council. So, uh, but we just wouldn't be able to have one or two councillors make the individual comments. Is my point. So, okay, council, we have some uh, future meetings uh, all recorded. Um, the one meeting that I noted at one point, though, is on the 25th. Let me check my proper notes. The 23rd, excuse me, Tuesday the 23rd was slated for a special council meeting, but it is now going to be a special general and finance committee meeting time to be determined to deal with our budget. Um, all the other planning meetings and special council meetings and council meetings are in our agenda package. At this point, I have a resolution moved by Councillor Kelly, seconded by Oak oh, Count. Uh, Mr. Sharp, you have a comment before we move into closed session. I saw your hand go up and come back down. Councillor Nishikawa, you want to comment or question? Yes, well, I'm, I'm a little concerned um, that I had budgeted out a time of um, that the budget meeting was going to take place at 2 p.m. And I, I, I'm very concerned. I, I can't do things on very short notice. I'm still running a business. So can we not just stick to the 2 p.m. that was already uh, slated? It, it's believed that we will try and uh, agree to that. It just uh, because it's changing from a council meeting to a GNF, there might be some slight changes, but uh, duly noted that we would try and stick to that 2 p.m. Thank you. Okay. I have a resolution moved by Councillor Kelly, seconded by Councillor Roberts, be it resolved that Council in closed session convene at 5.15 p.m. Uh, for litigation or potential litigation, including matters before administrative tribunals affecting the municipality or local board, one Ontario land tribunal matter, pursuant to section 239.2 of the Municipal Act 2001. All those in favor? Madam Clerk, we carry, thank you. Okay, we will turn off.